feed into our last and final day of the workshop. Uh, I, I think we all are testament to it that the past few days of our workshop have been immensely fulfilling and educational. It has not only opened about the maritime awareness, but has also left room for us to actively participate and gain deeper knowledge into the UDA and its framework. You know, it also uh, teaches us as civilians what it needs, uh, what uh, a civilian and what we should take upon ourselves to understand and contribute in an impactful manner. We are forever grateful for MRC for organizing a well-rounded workshop such as this. Without wasting any much more time and respecting all of y'all who have come on time, uh, we will be heading into a special session on maritime governance. I would uh, like to uh, let you know or inform you a little bit about our speaker who's gonna be joining us. It's truly an honor to have Lieutenant General D.B. Shekatkar in our midst. He's also the chairman of Shekatkar Committee. Uh, committee. Uh, he's a retired army officer. He was commissioned on the 30th of June, 1963 into the Maratha Light Infantry. The Shekatkar Committee was formed by Center under Ministry of Defense to suggest steps for enhancing combat compatibility of the armed forces. What better than to have someone who is well-rounded in his subject to come and brief us. But before I invite him, I would also like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Das to please come ahead and brief the audience. Thank you. Thank you. It is indeed an honor for us, and I must acknowledge uh, this event has been organized under the aegis of the Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence, who have partnered us for taking the skilling in the underwater domain forward. This particular event is supported by the HT Parikh Foundation. We are extremely grateful to them. And I must also acknowledge that there are many organizations which are behind such an event to be organized. It was extremely ambitious for us to go ahead with this program. Uh, this was a time when there were exams also, but we've had in the last two weeks, we've had at least 40 to 50 people joining us physically. And also we've had people joining us uh, online. Uh, we've had a series of lectures. I will talk about it uh, in a while. Uh, we are extremely honored, and I'll request all the senior people uh, to uh, come on stage. Uh, General Shekatkar, sir, kindly uh, come. come. <coughs> um, Admiral Ajay Kocher, sir, kindly come forward, sir. <coughs> Vikram Puri, sir. Ram Chandani, sir. I'll request General Shakatka sir to kindly give his welcome address, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The galaxy of people sitting in this hall this morning to attend this important event. We are in Pune, and those who are in Delhi, we know it better. It is not how many were present in a hall or a function, but it is who were present. Normally, people go by how many were the. They don't bother about sir kitne the. So we are lucky to have the excellent people in this hall this morning. Don't go by number, don't go by crowd. But it is the experience, the cumulative experience of everybody. We'll be sharing some of our thoughts. We are lucky 
to have Admiral Kocher, the commandant of the National Defense Academy, a well-known. Uh, may I call you soldier, sir, with your permission? Hello. Because he's a great experienced person. We'll be listening to him. We have Mr. Ram Chandani, who is with the Larsen Tubro and looking after the defense uh, thing with him. We also have with us Mr. Puri, who is a well-known person dealing with variety of things, and I know him for quite some time. We have Mr. Talera with us, Prafulji. So there's a galaxy of people. I won't take much time, but highlight certain point of view. There are naval officers sitting here, so it'll be wrong for an infantryman who is not supposed to have brain to speak anything about the world. But if I know my data correctly, and whatever we had recommended in the committee of report, the so-called Shikadkar committee, actually the committee of experts, the real thing is the committee of experts to ensure modernization, reorganization, and strategic orientation of India for at least 35 years. By mistake, by some chance, then the Honorable Raksha Mantri, Mr. Parikar, God bless his soul, he was speaking in this particular, like something like in this hall, not here, but in Delhi. And after his talk, he was asked a question by a journalist who was very well informed. He said, when are you going to appoint the chief of defense staff? So he told him that we are waiting for the report of the committee under the chairmanship of General Shekhar and he made a mistake that when we get the report of the Shekhar committee, we will take the decision. From that day, the committee got quite on the sideline and the Shekhar committee came in. So there is a saying sometimes, but nami se hi magar naam to hua. So here it is, I'll be sharing some of the points on that. Today, we all know better the naval people they call it the principle of 70, 80, 90. It is the 70% of the world which is with sea or oceans. 80% population of the world is all along the sea coast, all over the world. 80% population. And 90% of world trade is passing through oceans. And that's why, very rightly, the naval people, they call it 70, 80, 90. And the topic which we are going to discuss today, the marine security, the security of the sea below the water surface is assuming importance day by day. A committee had recommended that there's a need to pay greater attention to all the naval aspects of India's defense, because gradually India's defense and India's trade and India's influence in the world is going to increase. This is what I wrote as a chairman on 19th of December, 1916, 2016, sorry, 9th of December, 2016. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. But everything is coming true. Everything is coming true today. And that is where probably the future predictions, they hold good. Look at the world, the way it is changing. And if we don't keep ourselves with the changing world, we will be left behind and people will go ahead. Today, if you see, there's the Indo-Pacific region. Till few years back, Americans used to call it Pacific region, the theater command of United States of America was Pacific oriented. And they have now included this Indo-Pacific region because of the maritime interest, the oceanic interest of the Americans are now extending right from Australia till Suez Canal and up to Mediterranean Sea. Nobody could think of this just 10 years back. So we have to look at these 
in that context. Today, you see the Western theater of United States of America is totally in a trouble. There's no nation in the theater which is having a peaceful life. No nation, not even one except Oman, who can claim to be slightly peaceful, but otherwise everybody is facing a clash of something or other. But this is a reality of fact. Today you see there are eight choke points in the oceanic trade or routes throughout the world. You choke two of them and almost 90% of traffic through the sea will come to a grinding halt. Just three years back, there was a problem in Suez Canal. Either a tanker or a ship got stuck up and for almost about a week, there was no communication, there was no trade from that route. Just three days back, you saw the American drone and there was a clash between the Russian aircraft in Black Sea of all the places. Russian-Ukraine war is going on for control of sea. It is the Black Sea which is essential for transportation of entire Russian things. Otherwise, they'll have to go all the way almost to the eastern coast of Russia. Why I'm giving you this reason? This is, we have to be aware and we have to be prepared to meet these challenges. Other thing we were to take, the American naval assets in years to come are going to come to India for logistic support, for repairs, and for other things. The two plus two dialogue which has started under the leadership of Shiparikar has now borne the fruits. Gone those days, it was one to one. Now it is the foreign affairs and the defense affairs that are going together. And another two days, two years time, we'll find the Ministry of Trade who is dealing with export and import will also become part of the system. This is a fact of life. And if we are not prepared to accept this opportunity or challenge, then we will be left behind. Security of assets along the sea coast, and this is all connected to underwater domain. I was mentioning to one of the top politicians of the state, came to meet me on some other issue, that be prepared by 2024, you should be prepared to face another attack by a terrorist organization from sea. Told him very clearly, and that's why they had come probably to meet and find out what are going to be the threats. The reason being, now the terrorist or any other organization who has to create a problem for India or in Bombay, don't have to come on the seashore. They can do the damage from 13, 14, 15, 16 nautical miles away and get away before we come to know. And that will be all be using the under the water surface channel system. You saw the Ukraine pipeline, which is in news nowadays. Every nation is blaming somebody else. Somebody is blaming Ukraine, somebody is blaming Russia, somebody is blaming United States. But the fact is that pipeline was damaged. And it has been damaged beyond repair. And look at the problem it has created. Just two years back, on the western coast of North Africa, the internet cables were disconnected. The entire communication system came to a grinding halt. And we in India, we have to be careful because our strategic reserves are going to be in Andaman Nicobar, maybe in one or two neighboring countries, and our communication system is going to pass through these bases. So we have to be concerned about it. We have to be careful about it. 
Another example I give you, I'm just giving you based on whatever I have studied. And we have informed our government also that we got to be careful. Not then, but even now. Just yesterday, you must have seen up probably today in parliament, the bill is going to be uh, submitted or introduced, will become an act once it is passed in parliament about the theaterization of the command structure. Deliberately, we are not calling it theater commands. It is going to be the legal system, other system of the theater. Theater, which is meant by the army, the Air Force, Navy, and others. Deliberately, it has not been introduced as the theater command with the theater command word. Probably yesterday it has been introduced, or today, probably the Honorable Raksha Mantri is going to introduce the bill in the parliament. Why it is so? Because there is a realization that nobody can face the consequences of any damage all by himself. There's a need to come together and need to work together, need to plan together, and need to act together. This togetherness is bringing the concept of theaterization. Take the theater commands of United States of America. They are uncountable, answerable to one person who is the theater commander. And everybody is under him. In our context, there is need for rethinking. Look at the Indian assets. Right from the state of Gujarat till Tamil Nadu and even up to Orissa, 80% of GDP of India is earned from these states. 80% of GDP of this India. And if something goes wrong, you can imagine what will happen. All our value targets are located in this part. Take Bombay itself, Mr. Ramchandani is there. And I know his office is very close to see for some reason. All our valuable assets, take the Atomic Power Center, take the Bombay Stock Exchange, take the Reserve Bank of India, take Mantrale, take Raj Bhavan, you take Navashiva Port and Area Dhyan, I don't want to mention those two names deliberately. They're all located within one and a half to two kilometers from the sea shores. Will you require somebody to come on the sea coast now? Or he can do the damage remaining below the sea surface. Now these are the new challenges going to come. And therefore, I must compliment Commander Arnab Das and his team. They've already been thinking on these lines. And I would request you, Arnab, if you may, uh, Mr. Ramchandani is there, we can start with some sort of consultancy. Keep thinking ahead, five years ahead, 10 years ahead, and keep advising the people who need this, who have to be acting upon that thing. Advising is one thing, but to follow that advice and convert it into actionable action plan is very different thing. So this is my request to you, Arnab, if you feel it is there. The next uh, point I would request you for your kind consideration, all of you are there. The entire world has been only wor working on extraction of the minerals which are on the ground floor, on the earth floor, earth surface. How many of us have bothered ever to think what is below the sea? In next 10 years, you will find this is going to take a big place, particularly the rare earth concept and so on. Chinese are not fools when they are calling China, South China Sea and they are one after other island, they are trying to enlarge the things. There must be some reason. There's not enough money in China to throw it in the South China Sea. And suddenly we will be coming across that some of the minerals which are required for the advanced world are in that part. We are also having an art trade coast. We have the entire western coast of India. If you just go about 12 to 13 to 14 nautical miles away, and you will find it is there. The survey has been carried out in a number of places. And it's been kept as a closely guarded secret. So this is what my impression is when we say about the seminar, the discussion, the future which remains in this part. If we don't think today, well, then we have to blame ourselves and nobody else. 
on more complicated subject this is i put across to you as a ill informed infantry soldier i mentioned to you infantry soldiers particularly the army pangos what do you call them with my respect to my colleagues sitting in green uniform they are not supposed to having brain and i told once our honorable raksha mantri then thank god we don't have brain thank god if we had brain and if you had told us to go to uri we would have asked you sir kal kar lenge aaj kya dil di hai you use the brain sometimes the brain must be kept away and the decision must be followed in the right term he say he told me give two example even the honorable president raksha mantri once he said kya hoga humne kaha sir wohi hoga jo nahi hona chahiye if we start using too much of technology too much of thinking too much of analysis too much of things by the time we act it will be too late this is what i understand from the concept which mr das commander das and his team is trying to work out at last am i right kora i think it's the same finally just two points for your kind considerations security of assets along the sea coast is going to be a major challenge to the naval and the air force people it is already there but it's going to be more and that's why very rightly our naval system is now gradually getting into the air mode there are reasons the second thing which is going to come i'm all giving you futuristic time that avionics are going to play a major role it may be with drone it may be aircraft it may be satellite maybe space or whatever it is and the third thing which is going to come if we don't cash on to the minerals deposited mineral deposits in the proximity or eez of india we can't blame anybody else but to ourselves and i'll once again recommend arnab and command you sir kindly put it all these to those who are decision makers you had submitted a report i've seen that and it has been accepted very well by the government even the national security council council has taken the note of it so keep doing that we are listening to the galaxy of people compile those details and put it across to them and i will also recommend give a personal copy to honorable raksha mantri ji on that point he will take it and i the best person to do you normally we think oh unko kya pata lagta yaar wo kya dekhega file hamari wo kahin dal dega jahan bhi dalega wahan jagah hogi na there must be some people who are advising him there must be some people who are working with him there are advisors now working with the honorable raksha mantri and the defense secretary both and they are all from the uniform community i think so once again i thank you sir grateful to you general coacher sir airfield coacher sir you have been with us sir ramchandrani has come all the way mr puri is going to them you will be listening to them i thought i'll just make these brief uh, comments for your consideration and keep thinking i can see people sitting in this hall who will become the admirals who will hold greater appointments and by the time you hold those places challenges are going to increase challenges are going to increase because in 2019 2018 when we were working on this committee report when we submitted our recommendation they were laughing at us they were laughing at us and now every sentence almost every paragraph is coming true as i mentioned to you only today probably yesterday it has been done or today the concept of theaterization is going to be introduced in the parliament and taken it will become an act the moment it is passed by the parliament it won't be difficult for the parliament in the clear condition to pass the bill i am grateful to you and thank you for listening to me sir i don't know kindly pardon me if i not made a sense but this is what my understanding is when we see the things from the futuristic point of view where to work out the people i am sure i am quite aware must be some of the foreign friends must be listening to me probably online or the others who are not here present on that line my request is 
look at India with a great hope. India is a nation who has a tremendous amount of confidence, the caliber and excellence. Just three days back, the concept of quad and other things have come out and India is going to be playing a major role. In fact, India has become the most important hub in the entire world today, in the world affairs, the security affairs, the communication affairs, trade affairs, the commerce affairs, and even the economic affairs. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me this chance. Grateful to you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> I think for the young audience, uh, the Shekatkar Committee report is one of the unique reports where majority of the recommendations are not just accepted, but they are getting implemented in a very short time. And uh, it is, uh, and many of them, as sir said in a very different uh, note, they're extremely revolutionary, completely disruptive as well. And, but they are all getting implemented, not just accepted. So it's a very unique report. And we at MRC has been extremely fortunate to get his continued guidance and su <coughs> support. And uh, I personally uh, go and discuss with him various aspects. And at the end of it, I'm very, very honored that many of them, not just mature, but I also get the next level of support where the right authority in the government is able to listen to my ideas and many of them are definitely getting implemented. Now, I'll, the whole purpose of this particular panel discussion is to bring various aspects. I would like to just give you a brief on how we have thought of it. First and foremost, uh, General Shekatkar, sir, uh, I wanted to request him because the whole Shekatkar Committee report itself has brought in aspect of efficiency, aspect of restructuring, reshaping to keep in pace with the present geopolitical and geostrategic <coughs> realities. So I wanted request, I requested him to kindly give his welcome address, and then I wanted to get the industry representation on two different fronts. Puri, sir, has been working very closely with the armed forces, particularly Navy and Coast Guard. More innovative ideas they are trying to push through and working very closely with our armed forces in terms of Atma Nirbharta. So I requested, sir, to kindly join us. Then, of course, Ram Chandani, sir, from LNT, they work at a different level. Again, LNT is, I think, singularly a company which has invested significantly in capacity building. So, no better organization than LNT to give us a sense of where we are heading. Even the nuclear submarine is being built by them, and they are into multiple things. Sir, will uh, speak about it. Then, of course, <coughs> Admiral Ajay Kocha, sir. Not just he is commander in NDA, but a senior naval commander. I had the fortune of being his shipmate at, at some point, but I had a, a very detailed discussion recently with sir. And so I thought that perspective is very important. The user perspective is very important. The larger strategic vision from the maritime security perspective is very critical. And UDA is being discussed in the Navy's top echelons, it has become a commander's conference point and it is being discussed multiple times. So uh, we would like to hear from sir. And of course, uh, Praful uh, <coughs> Talerajee, because in terms of blue economy, in terms of logistics, he has a very different perspective. He has been part of the industry bodies. He has been driving <coughs> a various, I mean, not just that he's the founder of Dynamic Logistics, one of the most important logistic companies in the country. But he has always been known for uh, out of the box thinking. So, and he has been our um, MRC blue economy advisor. He has a very different perspective on blue economy and the geopolitics. So I thought we all, and I will of course give you a little bit on what this UDA vision is and 
today i'm not going to go into the basics of it we have very senior people here i am going to talk about the larger drive that we have been taking forward where have we reached and also seek your <coughs> inputs on that so uh, this particular workshop is being recorded it is being live streamed and we have participants from not just from india but we have also participants from uh, sri lanka and various other places so i'll talk about uh, the workshop in a while and i'll request uh, vikram puri sir to kindly make his comments good morning ladies and gentlemen general shekatkar thank you for giving us that very quick snapshot of command and man management you also designated mr ramchandani's office as target number 1 tango 1 but i think these are all very real concerns and uh, uh, we in the industry uh, realize and and uh, you know we try to put all these things in context so india has 7500 kilometers of coastline that needs to be monitored governed protected and defended that uh, ladies and gentlemen by the way is more than all the land borders of the country put together in addition if you add the 200 km economic zone that we are supposed to that we that we own and we uh, you know uh, claim as our own that's a one and a half million square kilometers of area that needs to be patrolled secured and made safe for our own use governance of our maritime resources is now of utmost importance and has the highest priority should have the highest priority our maritime capability drives economic activity 70% of india's trade by value 70% is maritime only 30% is air and other 90% of it by volume in tons is maritime the other 10% though significant because a lot of it is electronics and high value uh, trade is still very small in volume our oil energy food everything comes in by sea and that's why maritime trade needs to be managed and protected with far higher priority than any other similar need the the word of the year for india is integration we are talking about integrated theater commands we are talking about integrated uh, processes we are talking about integrated political governance we are talking about integrated everything integration is our uh, word of the decade in fact and i'm going to give you a little uh, snapshot of what we in the industry see as the uh, potential possibility and need to protect and manage and i use the word manage more than protect our maritime resources and our and protect our rights first of all we have no means of constantly and continuously surveilling our coastline and our coastal waters as well as our economic waters so there is a need for a complete system an integrated system of listening posts or watches to be put up all along the coastline of course starting at a very at higher strategic places of higher strategic importance but nevertheless the entire coastline needs to be policed patrols or uh, you know responsive or reactive policing simply doesn't work as we have seen we have not been able to 
stop any of the uh, maritime intrusions that have taken place, uh, especially terrorist action, because there's, there's such small and unobtrusive elements coming in that the process and the system simply isn't good enough. What is required is a complete on ground or correct myself, in the sea listing system. Almost 90% of our smaller fishing vessels, the ones that slip through our controls, are not even tracked or monitored. Larger ships have EIS, they have uh, identification, we have IFF systems, aircraft have IFF systems, but these small vessels have nothing. So what is required is a, a very quick, flexible, easy to deploy, integrated data acquisition system across this entire coastline. So how do you do something like that, you know, without spending literally billions of dollars setting it up? As you know, ladies and gentlemen, India is going into 5G in terms of wireless capability. We are one of the uh, leading countries in the world to go to 5G. We've been fortunate that we were delayed in our move to cellular communications, and therefore we got the latest in cellular communications compared to the rest of the world. While the rest of the world was on analog systems, we were on digital. So 5G deployment is quick and easy along the coastline. 5G deployment is a condition of license for every 5G operator in the country. 5G has the bandwidth, the frequency, and the ability to pick up this kind of data if it is acquired. So here's the biggest uh, opportunity here. Anything to do with wireless data, wireless data acquisition, wireless data transmission, wireless data encryption is something that the industry should look forward to. The other area, the data acquisition, a surface, above surface and below surface, floating marine listening net, something that can be simply deployed by just, just deploying a buoy, something that India, fortunately, by the way, has um, a large part of the year has access to sunlight uh, along the coastline. And therefore, powering those listening nets using solar systems is, is, is not something that is uh, ridiculously expensive or, or uh, unreasonable or impractical. So a complete listening system along the coastline, deployed along the coastline, that is smart, that is self-healing, that is point to multipoint. That means each listening device can transmit to another listening device rather than having to directly connect to the network. Building in redundancy in itself. A low cost IFF device for Indian fishing vessels, fishing trawlers and smaller vessels. Making it mandatory for every boat, every ship, every every vessel to have some sort of simple voyage data recorder or a marine voyage data recorder those are not expensive and they don't have to be the ones certified by the imo they don't have to be uh, uh, devices that are uh, you know imported at great cost now what do you do with all of this data that's flowing so you've got these floating boys they're listening to what's happening in the air they're listening to what's happening on the surface they're even listening to what's happening below. I'm not sure whether we still have the, yet have the technology to decipher all the signatures that we are getting from subsea uh, uh, listening posts, but they're available. So what do you do with all of this data? It's a humongous amount of data. And as I said before, when I started, the, the word of the decade is integration. So all of this data needs to go into an integrated platform with our own geographical information system. As you know, India has launched what we call the IRNSS, the Indian 
regional national satellite system. And the IRNSS is a set of satellites. We, we are still in the process of launching the whole lot. At this time, we have limitations in terms of coverage. We have limitations in terms of range. But we are replacing the GPS. And at every uh, talk that I've given, every speech that I've given, and I would also request General Shekatkar, sir, also to uh, take note of this and, and add this to his advice to the government, that the GPS system puts us in the hands of a political today partner, and they actually control what we see or what we hear and where we can go. So it's so India is moving to the IRNSS system, and this network across the coastline will be so needs to be supported by the IRNSS. To a great extent, it already is, and the manufacture of those chipsets has already started in India. So we are we are we are looking at a clear uh, direction to becoming self-sufficient, to having our own listening network, to having an integrated data acquisition and operations platform. Now, this operations platform needs to be available for civilian use, for coast guard, for the coast guard, for the navy, for the air force, or the integrated commands. The government, as you probably know, has already started publishing what they call public data. So if you go on most government websites, there will be a link which says you, you click on this and then you can go and actually connect your server to government data today. Something that wasn't available five or ten years ago. I remember that I had to file RTIs to get data for the location of petrol pumps in the country. That was considered a security risk at the time. And today, the government has understood that making data public, uh, you know, the, the, the use and the, and, the, and the convenience far supersedes the security concerns that could be associated with the release of that data. We need to protect our fishing rights. We need to protect our um, maritime assets, our minerals that are below the sea. We need to uh, protect our possible oil uh, deposits that may be there, our prospecting rights. All of this has to happen or and needs to happen. But without an integrated system, without something that generates this data where it can be instantly analyzed. I think all of us have gone through this whole, uh, you know, life uh, style change of managing data in our, in our jobs. So earlier we were managing very little data. Now we are flooded with uh, humongous amounts of data and we need machines to make our decisions for us. So, so our machines are filtering that data and telling us that this is, this doesn't require your attention, but this does. And what you are handling now, what we call large data is actually the filtered data. This data that is generated from these, from these, you know, coastal and maritime data acquisition points, needs to go into a central data processing facility that is, in fact, not central. When I say central, I mean it needs to be centrally available, but it cannot be central. So it's a distributed and a distributed data processing, which is the way data is processed. Huge amounts of data is processed these days. So now I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to envisage a network of listening posts 200 miles, 200 kilometers deep from the coastline, all along our coasts, generating data at the frequency of maybe one second, giving you the movement of every surface, subsurface, and air uh, 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 piece of equipment that's moving across that zone or that area, classifying it, labeling it and giving you an initial filter of saying that this is a possible foe or, or a possible threat. And threats don't come only from military threat. Threats come from economic threats. Other, other countries coming and fishing in your waters. Uh, if, if Indian fishermen are unable to uh, you know, uh, make a living out of our own maritime resources, that impacts our shipbuilding. That impacts our coastal economic development. That, that has a cascade on everything else. 
it impacts our uh, uh, you know our uh, movement of goods and and uh, material it impacts our coastal movement because if shipbuilding slows down then it becomes unattractive to make even you know coastal vessels anymore so this is one of the most uh, you know most important economic uh, areas of concern and industry and technology needs to uh, focus uh, focus on these for us as industry we see tremendous opportunity this is also the decade of opportunity for us so we see tremendous opportunity in companies that will make uh, as i said 5g wireless equipment or even provide 5g wireless services data services internet access services in these zones floating and submerged listening equipment aquatic listening equipment and i'm talking about you know something simple something quick to deploy something that you can actually throw in the water and it starts to work an instant tactical network and tactical not only for the military in the military sense but tactical even in the economic sense the ais the low cost ais for smaller vessels is critical we need to identify every vessel every fishing boat every everything that belongs to us everything that belongs to india we need to identify and label it and and that is actually the first step in in uh, uh, you know uh, trying to protect our our waters the other area is uh, gis uh, map data the, the navy calls them charts the army calls them maps the civilians simply say data and and we have gis data in multiple layers for multiple areas this data is being slowly released by the government but unfortunately the government doesn't have much of it so a lot of the data just like google maps needs to be acquired by the public so every time a fishing boat fitted with an with a homemade ais goes out there the information that's coming back goes into a database and a data set is created every time a patrol vessel goes out and patrols a particular area all that happens is a patrol report is made that data stays somewhere in either the naval or coast guard base or the local police station if it's a police vessel but it never gets put onto a database and a data set is never created so integration of data and sharing of data between all the stakeholders is extremely necessary and extremely important and it is the speed with which the data is shared that makes the difference i think speed is the wrong word i, I the correct word would be a non english word like quickness or or how quickly can you share it so it's not the speed of data being transmitted that's important but how quickly how how low latent is the data how how low is the latency of the data that's being shared that's important the the other area when you got such a huge amount of data as you know um, india is um, uh, has begun to understand the importance of data we are passing our own data protection bill we are passing our data protection bill on the lines of the european gdpr but essentially the the focus of the data protection bill the indian data protection bill is to keep indian data in india so why is it necessary to even have a law to keep that indian data in india because it is cheaper to host your data outside india data centers in india are extremely expensive they are in short supply and that causes indian companies and indian organizations to host their data outside india so even when you put your data on if you use gmail and i know lots of service establishments use gmail it's the least secure and most certainly stored outside the country that that data needs to be within the country that data needs to be managed and processed and stored within the country so we need data centers which brings me to the you know the other big opportunity in india for maritime uh, governance and maritime security data centers both terrestrial and looking forward in the future 
underwater data centers. The biggest cost of running a data center is energy, and the biggest energy consumption in a data center is cooling cost, not processing cost. It's cooling cost. Air conditioning, chilling. These are so people have been experimenting with putting up data centers in the in the mountains, they're experimenting with putting data centers under the sea. And the ones under the sea work the best and the easiest. First of all, they're easy to deploy. They're easy to build. They're easy to reach. They also offer low latency. Because as you know, ladies and gentlemen, when you make a Skype call, if I make a Skype call, if I make a call from my phone to say Commander Das's phone, that call actually goes to the United States and then gets routed back to his phone. So the same thing applies to data and data centers. The closer you are to the source of data, the lower the latency, the lower the cost of transmission, the lower the cost of storage, and the lower the cost of redundancy. Redundancy being the keyword. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I believe that uh, this is the, uh, this is India's decade of maritime opportunity. This is India's decade of maritime awareness. And these are some of the, I will, I will quickly run through these again, just so that, you know, we've got them in context. These are the opportunities and these are the uh, focus areas for industry in, 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 in this decade. And all of them come with the leading word integration. So integrated 5G high-speed data, integrated floating and submarine listening posts across the, along the coastline, quick deploy systems, low-cost AI systems for our domestic vessels, smaller vessels, integrated GIS platforms, integrated with various other government organizations, including military operation rooms. A huge opportunity for administration of the entire system. So administering such a system itself is a business by itself, is, a, is an industry by itself. As you know, IT, IT services in, in every office, there is, a, there is a complete industry operating in the background. Somebody who's maintaining your network, somebody who's maintaining your computer, somebody who's uh, managing your uh, password, somebody who's checking your UPS, that's an industry. And in this case, managing these networks, maintaining these networks are, is going to be an industry by itself. And lastly, data centers, energy efficient data centers close to the source of data, located below the sea, possibly below the sea, but definitely near or on the coastline. All of these together with an integrated data acquisition and processing platform, giving simultaneous data to multiple consumers and multiple stakeholders is what we see the uh, maritime surveillance and economic protection and governance system uh, coming to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, sir. I'll give you a brief on what we have done, what was the intended purpose and what we have achieved. This uh, series of workshop was for achieving an institutionalized killing ecosystem to realize the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister, a new perspective based on the underwater domain awareness framework. As General Shakatka sir mentioned, there are a whole lot of security challenges, there are a whole lot of economic opportunities that are waiting for us. And as <coughs> Puri sir also mentioned, this is the decade for India. The whole geopolitical and geostrategic climate realities are extremely favorable to us. And if we today do not seize this opportunity, then I think nobody can help us beyond this. So we thought that how to, uh, and also we have the demographic advantage and a whole lot of things which is there. So what we planned is that now when we talk about the 
skilling ecosystem or institutionalizing the skilling, uh, skilling ecosystem, first and foremost, we must realize that we have to be aligned right from the global regulatory process or the policy framework to the regional, to national, and of course, to the local level. So in this whole workshop, we divided this into three parts. The first one was policy. Second, this one is on technology. And the third one, we are going to go next week to the Malwan Coast for field interaction with the coastal community. Many times in the process of development or the so-called development, we ignore the stakes of the communities, whether it is the coastal community or the riverine communities or certain other communities who are part of this system. So what we did in the beginning was we had speakers and when we talk about the Sagar vision, we were extremely lucky to get the people who were in the conceptualization process. Ambassador Mudgal in the beginning came and spent three days with us, who was uh, the ambassador of India to Mauritius when the Honorable Prime Minister declared this there. Ambassador Javed Ashraf was in the PMO, now he is India's ambassador to France. Ambassador uh, Ashraf was very kind to join us from, uh, he is now the India's ambassador to Paris. Uh, so he joined us from there. Mr. Hemang Jani was OSD to the Prime Minister at that time in the PMO, and he joined us. Now he's in an even more important position. He is the Secretary of the Capacity Building Commission. The government is now extremely conscious, and they have set up this Capacity Building Commission. The whole mandate of this commission is to build skilling, knowledge, and attitude among the 30 million government officials across the center and the state. So Mr. Hemang Jani was very kind to come and spend two days with us during this first phase of the uh, workshop. And they are taking this forward. We have been tasked to build e-learning modules. We've been tasked to do a series of workshops across the country to sensitize them on the UDF framework. The second is, the, this is the decade of the ocean sciences of the uh, declared by the UN. The Intergovernmental Ocean Commission, which is driving that, it is headed by Vladimir Rubin. Vladimir Rubin joined us from Paris and also took away, and uh, we also made presentations, one of our, uh, because today marine special planning has become the de facto. Uh, Purisa mentioned the GIS Act has been passed. Now, even in the underwater, they use the term marine special planning. The UN is pushing this in a very different level. European Union is pushing it in a different level. And of course, Government of India is extremely serious. And so the GIS Act has been passed. So the marine special planning, the Ministry of Earth Sciences is driving that aspect. All the underwater components are being looked at. And we at MRC have a unique uh, position in terms of working on the tropical waters. So we are in the process of building the, uh, we are, I think we have built the larger framework, the underwater channel uh, perspective is already there. And so one of our fellows made a presentation to uh, Vladimir Rubin. Right now we are happy to report that we are working with three UN agencies. International Seabed Authority is also in discussion with us for capacity building across the globe. The UNESCO is working with us of, on setting up a center of excellence to support uh, Africa and uh, uh, South Asia. and. The Intergovernmental Ocean Commission is working, uh, is keen to work with us on this marine special planning. Now, when you look at marine special planning, it can have so many aspects. Underwater noise uh, and also, of course, the International Maritime Organization. They have allocated $2 million for the entire underwater noise framework in the Indian Ocean. Now, uh, India has been, uh, it was our paper which went to them in 2019. And based on that, now India has been nominated as the nodal country for underwater underwater noise in the ocean uh, in the indian ocean so we will get an opportunity to contribute to that but we are also requesting the government that under the sagar vision noise is just one component of it there is so much more that can be done we have also built tools for managing the coastal communities whether it is shrimp farming whether it is seaweed farming there is a lot of uh, uh, merit in building technology tools which can support the community. The coastal communities or the riverine communities do not get support from financial institutions because there's a lot of uncertainty. These kind of tools can br bring down that kind of uncertainty. So Ministry of Environment is also 
uh, working with us in terms of developing these tools for a policy and also operational intervention. So <clears throat> based on this, we have in the second workshop as Digital Ocean is being talked about again and again, we had lectures by uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish from CDAG, who's part of the National Supercomputing Mission. He gave a lecture on high performance computing and what is the government of India's or the National uh, Supercomputing Mission's uh, agenda and how where, where we are. He spoke on that. Then we had uh, Mr. Venk, uh, Dr. Venkat from, uh, he heads the quantum computing in IBM. He came and spoke on the entire initiative of quantum computing and IBM is one of the leading groups globally driving. And he mentioned that the government in India is the biggest investor in the quantum computing now. And they are really supporting IBM in a very big way and government, government is partnering, government of India is partnering them in taking this forward. Then we also had uh, uh, Mr. Manas uh, on the metaverse. That is another visualization or immersive experience as they call it. These are various tools that will allow us to realize the digital dream uh, for the country. <clears throat> then we also had uh, Ambassador Raj Srivastava uh, uh, talking to our uh, uh, participants on the Indo-EU relations and how the European Union is now looking at India for the whole digital uh, initiative. Uh, <clears throat> then we had uh, <clears throat> various other experts. We also looked at two historians coming and talking because India is a civilization of almost 10,000 years. There's a lot of traditional knowledge, traditional practices, which can be, and we had Dr. Radhika session who talked about what are these traditional knowledge and how they are relevant even today. So, and sometimes uh, when we got colonized, we shifted and almost kind of forgot about these things and how they are important. She had a very fantastic lecture and it was very well appreciated by all present. And she's going to be speaking today also after this session on the maritime history and what are the lessons to be drawn. Then we had uh, uh, Professor Ajay uh, 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 talking on the various other aspects uh, from a historian's perspective and where the economy, how it has evolved and probably some of the areas which need correction, uh, complete historical perspective. Then we also <coughs> had um, <coughs> Dr. David Brewster from Australia. Uh, he has been part of the Indo-Australian Strategic Partnership and uh, he is a maritime strategist, security strategist uh, of more than 30 years of experience. So he spoke about the Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean region and what we can do and how India is well placed and how India has to, uh, I mean, he also mentioned certain gaps in terms of our capacity, in terms of taking uh, the maritime or the underwater domain forward. We were very fortunate to have Lieutenant General Vinod Khandare, sir, uh, joining us yesterday. He was the military advisor to the uh, National Security Advisor, and also now he's the uh, advisor to the Honorable Raksha Mantri, somebody who has been part of the larger security strategy formulation at the top level. He continues to be at that level, and he has a good... <coughs> uh, and so he gave us a very broad understanding, and he also very clearly mentioned the importance of uh, our traditional knowledge and the heritage that we had and how many of them are very relevant and we need to look at it in a very, very different perspective. So uh, this underwater domain awareness framework that we have built, the basic uh, tenant is that it encourages pooling of resources and synergizing of effort. As you would appreciate, I have a senior naval commander here, the, Tropical waters have a very unique characteristics. The first and foremost is the sonar performance. If you have to see below the water, it has to be in acoustics, but in the tropical water, the performance degrades to almost 60%. So there is a very important focus required to build capacity, which works in art. I mean, typically we have been looking at the West to give us support, but I mean, even the Nordic countries are now trying to help us in the freshwater systems. But I mean, the question is, do they really understand the tropical waters? And somewhere we have now started realizing that there's a lot of work to be done. So there is a lot of focus required uh, in terms of the tropical, even the siltation is very different. I mean, we must appreciate that our conditions are different. And unless we get into indigenous effort, this cannot be sorted out. Uh, uh, Shekhar Kasa also mentioned about the river systems, the freshwater systems, there are security concerns there. 
how do we look at it in a very serious manner how do we build systems in place and because of sir we got some opportunity we have given certain reports and uh, we are very happy to uh, uh, say that uda is definitely being considered at the highest level and the larger framework that we have proposed is being taken seriously and i think we will get more opportunities to contribute so we are looking at it all the three levels policy intervention technology intervention and also the capacity and capability building unless across different levels whether it is policy maker stakeholder practitioner they all come together we will not be able to achieve what we want to really achieve for india uh, in this workshop we are extremely happy we have had uh, uh, representations from the uh, indian navy uh, uh, senior officers have been deputed from very important organizations which are into uh, the larger strategy formulation in the navy i'll request some of them also to give, give a, a feedback on what they have experienced uh, indian army has been very kind thanks to general shekatkar sir uh, we've had participants from the indian army uh, cme also uh, sent officers for, uh, in the first workshop then we have officers from the indian coast guard they have been very kind they have sent uh, uh, senior officers uh, to attend this and also coastal police we re have represented from coastal police and institute of marine engineers has deputed these are some of the organizational uh, deputations that have come and also young students have come from various uh, uh, colleges uh, they have young students are a little more free i think they they have on and off attended but on the online we've had uh, uh, officers from the sri lankan navy who have joined there are uh, officers from uh, many other countries who have joined and also people are taking note because uh, this entire workshop is being streamed live and also it will be recorded and it will be made available in our mrc website because we would like more and more people to take note of it and in the next uh, workshop we are going to the malwan coast uh, the the first day they will be taken for a mangrove trail on boats they will be taken and shown how the entire mangrove the mangrove foundation is uh, partnering us in that then uh, climber crew is partnering us in seaweed the, uh, there is aquaculture uh, exposure that has been planned and also the uh, institute of diving uh, national institute of diving in uh, malwan is also exposing them and taking them on a ocean cruise also and how to various aspects of tourism and diving are important and how they can help in nation building so i'll request captain bhatia to kindly uh, say a few give a feedback on the last few days that they have been part of so thank you so much uh, and in this uh, august uh, gathering of so any senior officers uh, i take this opportunity first and foremost sir i would like to thank on behalf of navy for having invited us to be a part of this journey and uh, i have been here for the since, since this beginning of this week and been a part of this uh, 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 second part of the workshop and uh, i definitely agree that uh, whatever so the manner in which you have covered this particular workshop various facets that you have brought out has really been uh, you know you not only post challenges but you have actually brought out a lot of solutions to this and uh, navy definitely has been uh, into this particular domain and whether it is aerial whether it is surface whether it is subsurface but uh, uh, when you come to a workshop like this you realize that yes it is not only navy but apart from navy there are other agencies that are working towards it and you have been able to be possible to you know integrate so many other Uh, agencies into it so all of us coming together i'm sure uh, it'll be a great uh, thing and if we can take this uh, underwater domain uh, awareness because we all understand this underwater domain uh, area is a area which requires a lot of more uh, work to be done into it so definitely this particular workshop has been a great learning experience for me i'm taking a lot of uh, cues from here for uh, our naval hierarchy to you know and uh, thank you so much once again sir this workshop has really been very very educative and very informative for all of us thank you thank so you. much can i request uh, sir <coughs> so uh, thank you so much captain bhatia uh,
I'll request uh, Admiral Ajay Kocha, sir, to kindly give his chief guest remarks, sir. General Shaketkar, Mr. Puri, Mr. Talera, Commander Arnav Das, Mr. Ram Chandani, senior veterans, ladies and gentlemen, and the officers from the armed forces. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Maritime Research Center and the Indo-Swiss Center for Excellence for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with this August gathering. As a person in, or a man in white, you know, I don't think anyone could be happier than me to speak about this topic, maritime governance and matters maritime. It is also an honor and a privilege for me to speak on this topic because this has immense relevance to an aspirational maritime power like it, India. Ladies and gentlemen, the maritime characteristic of our nation is fundamental to our national identity and it is firmly embedded in our philosophy since time immemorial. With water on the three sides and mountains on the fourth side, our country lies in the lap of the Indian Ocean and is probably the only country which has an ocean named toward its name. Civilizations, empires, and kingdoms in India have been using you know, our maritime heritage and our positioning for pursuing prosperity and friendship for many centuries. Maritime trade between India, Western Asia, right up to Mediterranean and even Southeast Asia, as far as third millennium BC. The dry dock, you know, which was recently uncovered in Lothal, dating back to 2200 BC, signifies the importance of, you know, the maritime infrastructure and the kind of, you know, ports and such infrastructure we had, you know, in those good old times basically indicate, indicating that India from times immemorial has been a maritime nation and a maritime power. Backed by a strong maritime orientation, we continued to remain a wealthy nation and were very prosperous during the you know, second millennia of the common era. And history has regularly, regularly reinforced the fact that supremacy at sea is paramount to be a power and to be a relevant power in the world affairs. From the Romans and the Greeks in the medieval era to the rise of the European nations in the 16th and the 17th century, we have seen that sea power plays a very, very important and a major role in the establishment and growth of empires and nations. India too had its you know, periods of maritime strength with the Chola dynasty building significant influence in the areas bordering the Bay of Bengal and Southeast Asia, it was the Shivaji and the Maratha Navy that maintained a credible maritime posture on the western seaboard in India. Unfortunately, the ensuing period witnessed a decline of our maritime power, and it is in this time that the British, French, and the Portuguese arrived and they arrived by sea and made inroads in our country and eventually became the colonizers. This sea blindness during this period was, I could say, a small era of darkness. And therefore, we must remain cognizant of the fact that the freedom that we celebrate today was lost partly because we lost the maritime influence and the maritime power. This lesson of history was aptly articulated by Sardar K. M. Panikar when he famously said that India never lost her independence 
till she lost command of the sea in the first decade of the 16th century. At the stroke of midnight on 15th August 1947, as an independent nation, we once again started back our journey to the seas. The first step in that direction was to build a credible and a strong Navy. From a modest beginning of 33 ships at that time, you know, mostly which were foreign origin with limited capabilities and capacities. Today, we have built a Navy which has transformed into a balanced, networked, multidimensional and multi-spectrum force that reflects the opulence of the maritime and aspirational power like India. And it is this Navy which is today at the spearhead of maritime governess in the country. As uh, Vikram had brought out, we have a maritime coastline which has now been amended after you know, many researches to nearly 11,000 kilometers. And we have 1,400 islands today with a maritime exclusive zone of over 2 million square kilometers, which is about 63% of our total land mass. And it bears a treasure of marine wealth and resources. Our international trade is largely dependent on the seas and around 70% by value, as was already brought out, and 90% by volume of our foreign trade is seaborne. Around 86% of our oil needs are imported from across the seas, and another 5% is met from our offshore assets. And all these are vital enablers that drive our country's prosperity. The importance of seas has been well underscored by our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, who aptly stated that the Indian Ocean has shaped much of India's history and it now holds the key to our future. Thus, it should be clear that India's growth trajectory in the Amrit Kal is linked to the oceans and will be shaped by her ability to harness the seas. However, our maritime neighborhood with its vast resources and busy waterways is of interest not only to India, but also to a multitude of nations, regional and extra-regional. Inevitably, given its increased centrality in global affairs, the Indian Ocean clearly assumes importance well beyond its immediate shores and littorals. However, unlike the land domain, the maritime domain is slightly different and it has certain unique attributes. I have listed four of these such attributes which make it difficult to govern. First is that the oceans remain largely unregulated. Nearly 70% of the earth is covered by the ocean and 85% of the nation states have access to these waters. Yet its fluidity means that one cannot seize or hold or occupy the vast waters. The seas essentially remain free, while the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea 1982 has provided some amount of clarity on the jurisdiction and the permissible activities over the seas, the traditional and the enduring principle of the freedom of seas limits the absolute control that one can be enjoyed that can be enjoyed by any nation or any entity. The second attribute which I have listed is that these uncontrolled seas are largely unowned. Only about 5% of the seas being territorial seas are confirmed and confined by the laws of the land, while the remaining 95% are free for navigation and overflight. In terms of owning the resources, Nearly 90% of the seas by volume and 64% by surface area are beyond the exclusive economic zone of any country and therefore beyond the jurisdiction of any nation state. The third important attribute is that the lack of legal ownership translates into seas remaining largely unregulated. Their vastness accompanied by the tyranny of distance means that the seas cannot be organized or governed to any significant distance from any country's shores. 
Lastly, all these three characteristics in turn contribute to the oceans being global commons, free for access to all to navigate and to utilize in pursuit of your respective interest. Being global commons, the oceans also provide unfettered reach and access to nation states and therefore are a medium of choice for power projection. This brings with it an element of competition in the maritime domain. Now, these unique characteristics which I just listed also result in some exceptional challenges, especially in the Indian Ocean region and our areas of interest. There's a whole, you know, lot of list of challenges. I will just like to highlight a few because these challenges in turn dictate maritime governance because the challenges with what we face on these seas eventually decide how we govern these seas. First of all is maritime security. We are all aware of the phenomena of globalization and interdependence of trade, how this phenomena has made the world an interconnected place and how this has also led to mushrooming of many maritime related crimes such as piracy, smuggling, gun running and human trafficking. Maritime terrorism as we are all aware has spread across the oceans and there is evidence of various you know terrorist groups which have adopted the maritime route for exporting their ideology and even their expertise ensuring the safety and security of the shipping lanes and facilitating the movement of goods in this globalized world across the borders and across the seas you know, in cognizant of the threats which pre prevail today remains one of the topmost priorities for maritime governance. A new security challenge which has recently emerged, especially in our context, you know, on the western seaboard is narco-terrorism. Of late, Arabian Sea has become a hotbed of narcotics. You would have all read in the news how you know, there have been halls even in our ports. Basically, all these supply lines are emerging right from our neighborhood and the narcotics are being landed across multiple nation states within the Indian Ocean region. And the funds which are being generated are being used to fund terrorism. I would also like to list underwater domain awareness as a key challenge. UDA is not only important for us, you know, people in the uniform to be aware as to what is happening below the water, but you, the Earth's geophysical has also a lot of relevance to the well-being of humankind and monitoring of all, you know, underwater noise and signatures could provide vital clues to minimize the effect of devastating natural calamities also. The commercial activities in the undersea realm can also use UDA to get precise inputs of availability of resources to be able to effectively and efficiently explore and exploit them for economic gains. Now, in addition to these security challenges, there are certain benign tasks which propel the need for maritime governance. Amongst these, promoting sustainable use of ocean resources remains a foremost priority. The world's oceans are crucial for supporting life on Earth, providing food, energy, and raw material to millions of people residing on land. Therefore, effectively harnessing the blue economy, sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improving livelihoods and jobs, while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem by preventing overfishing, protecting marine biodiversity and reducing pollution in the ocean also requires maritime governance and requires responsible resource management. As I said earlier, to my mind, the maritime security and maritime governance are very, very 
closely linked as adoption of effective maritime security measures would ensure an efficient maritime governance mechanism. And as I said earlier, in this regard, Indian Navy being the principal manifestation of India's maritime power remains at the forefront of ensuring maritime security by remaining as a combat ready, credible, cohesive and a future proof force. Now, I will just like to, you know, explain these four facets of the Navy and how we are contributing to our maritime governance. The first issue which I mentioned is combat ready. The Indian Navy today is fully ready by continuously, you know, owning its skills, exercising and the key tenant of our combat readiness is our mission based deployments. Today we have the Indian naval ships spread out far and wide, starting from the Persian Gulf, Gulf of Aden, South Indian Ocean, and similarly on the Eastern Seaboard and many other areas of interest. The key facet is that when a naval ship is available in our areas of interest, we are able to react and respond very, very swiftly to any maritime challenge which emerges. Basically, we remain poised to react to any situation. In addition, this mission based deployments, which the Indian Navy has been following now for many years, enables us to know the complete geography and the activities which are happening in a particular area. And thereby we contribute to maritime governance. It also acts as kind of an assurance and an insurance for all our partners, for all the organizations and the seafaring community when they see that there is a Navy ship deployed in an area which can react and respond swiftly, it gives them a whole lot of assurance. Besides the mission based deployments, our ships are regularly and continuously deployed along with the Coast Guard to provide vigil along our coastal areas and to provide a bit of a coastal defense. You know, these deployments have not only ensured uninterrupted safety and security of India's interest in the maritime domain, but it has also elevated our stature as a country in the maritime domain by being a very, very credible maritime power. When I say credible, we enjoy this status because of our, you know, enhanced reach, sustenance and forward posturing, which has been demonstrated time and often when we have reacted to various challenges and contingencies. To remain a credible power, we are undertaking a host of activities with our partners also. Today, the Indian Navy is undertaking EZ patrols with friendly countries such as Maldives, Mauritius and many more and kind of giving them assurance that we are here as credible partners and will respond and will come to your aid and rescue as and when the situation demands. When I talk of Indian Navy as a cohesive force, I say this because we are the uniting force today to synchronize and synergize the efforts of multiple stakeholders in the maritime domain in a very, very holistic manner and effectively contribute to maritime governance. The first of these steps I would like to list is now recently the government has instituted a national maritime security coordinator, which was a demand, you know, post the Cargill war and uh, a recommendation of the Cargill review committee. Thereafter, the Indian Navy has been championing this cause. And today we finally have a Merit national maritime security coordinator who's facilitating coordination with nearly 15 agencies in the maritime domain, which include the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Police, the Ministry of Petroleum, Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Earth Sciences, and many such agencies who deal in the maritime domain. The next big initiative 
which the Navy has taken and which Vikram was referring to as how do we collect and integrate data. We have set up our national maritime domain awareness project where I can just say that information today on white shipping and to some extent of gray shipping is being collected and being sift and the whole data is being coordinated and controlled to get relevant outputs so that sitting in one place we can get a complete feel of the Indian Ocean and know what is happening where. Towards this, what again Vikram had mentioned, you know, establishment of AIS chains, establishment of listening post and collection of data from such post is all being synchronized and we have made substantial headway. Substantial headway since, you know, the times of 2008 to know what is happening in the waters around us. The next project is uh, the Information uh, Fusion Center, Indian Ocean region. It's not only the data which is coming from, you know, our sources. Today we have tied up and have agreements with multiple nations who share, you know, same principles and same interest and data from their sources is being collated. And today we also have observers, you know, in men in uniform from different countries who are sitting and, you know, kind of coordinating with us so that we have a complete awareness of the waters around us. That's why I refer to the Indian Navy as a cohesive force. Now, while we pursue this efforts to be combat ready, uh, combat ready, credible and cohesive, we are also future proofing ourselves. How are we doing that? This is through our unequivocal commitment to Atmanirbharta. As you had all heard, and uh, Mr. Ram Chandani would agree with me that the Navy is at the forefront of indigenization today. And today we have commissioned almost 32 ships. That is all ships barring two today are being made in India. And recently in the last few years, the Navy has inducted 32 ships from our own industry. And why I need to mention this, because all the ships are effectively going to get deployed in the oceans around us and contribute back to maritime security and maritime governance. What I just mentioned is uh, what we are doing internally within the Navy and within the country. But while we pursue these efforts domestically, all of us must remain cognizant of the fact that the challenges and the opportunities which are, you know, offered by the nations, uh, by the oceans are not unique to India. In fact, any maritime country or nation is facing almost similar challenges today. Therefore, we are fully cognizant of the fact that the challenges today are not to be handled individually by us. We have to enter into, you know, collaborative partnerships, collaborative engagements, and link up with, you know, organizations and states whose interest, you know, match with our interest. And it's only then that we'll be able to harness the complete resources, you know, which are available to us to ensure effective maritime security and maritime governance. Towards this, the Navy, that is the Indian Navy's, you know, Four pillars of foreign cooperation are based on capacity building, capability enhancement, constructive engagement, and collaborative efforts. I shall just touch upon these for a short while. The Navy also remains guided by the inclusive vis vision of Sagar, which uh, Dr. Das you know, recently referred to. Sagar, as we all know, stands for security and growth in the region. As part of Sagar, the Indian Navy has focused on three fronts. First is to be the preferred security partner. Second, become the first responder to any eventuality and contingency. And lastly, to build on the collective maritime competence. In pursuit of being a preferred security partner, we in the Navy aim to enhance the region's maritime security quotient through sustained forward presence, which I mentioned earlier, and preparedness for all maritime challenges. Our persistent presence 
enables us to be the first responder not only for contingencies in our country or around our waters but also for our friends and partners coming to the four principles of capacity building what we as a navy are doing we are not only building capacity for ourselves but for all the our friends in the indian ocean region and areas of our interest we are supplying hardware ships aircraft and the technical expertise so that collectively we are able to respond and contribute towards maritime governance as far as capability enhancement goes all our partner states and countries we are contributing towards training their people and giving them the right tools and exposure so that they are able to kind of monitor their maritime areas 24 by 7 we are getting into regular table top exercises as well as on field exercises with these countries the smaller countries around the indian ocean so that they get a fair amount of exposure as to how to handle various situations and how to effectively ensure safety and security of shipping lanes within their areas of jurisdiction uh, with regards to constructive engagements we have now signed a, a partnership with many countries where we do coordinated patrols coordinated patrol means undertaking joint patrols of you know navies of both the countries so that the message you know is sent out loud and clear to all inimical elements that there is a round the clock coordinated surveillance in the areas of interest and lastly for collaborative efforts we have uh, again signed up with many external agencies who are you know monitoring these oceans whether it is anti terrorism whether it is anti piracy or whether it is just sustainable use of ocean resources now while pursuing these efforts for maritime security uh i also want to highlight that india as a country has also instituted hardcore measures you know to harness the true potential of our oceans and to finally march on to our target of a 5 trillion economy towards this some of the key pillars probably would have been discussed in the last few days but i just want to highlight the key po policy articulations which our country has undertaken the first was the project sagarmala which was port led development announced by the government a few years back we also had a policy framework on blue economy uh in which the government of india is going to give impetus by enhancing our contribution to the india's gdp through our blue economy and thereby improving the lives of coastal communities preserving marine biodiversity and maintaining national securities of marine areas and resources our government has also come out with a maritime vision 2030 which is a blueprint to accelerate holistic growth of the maritime sector and lastly the country has also come out with a deep ocean mission to explore you know the deep oceans for resources and develop dc technologies for sustainable use of ocean resources the point what i'm trying to highlight is it is just not that at the security you know level the navy or the nation is working the nation today is holistically looking at the marine environment so as to harness our you know surroundings in such a manner that we propel our country to one of the you know premier uh, marine uh, nation with a rich legacy lastly i just want to say that uh, while indian navy remains the prime manifestation of uh, the country's uh, maritime security and maritime growth we are able to do it only because of certain unique attributes you know which a na any navy has most of you would be you know thinking as to what the navy actually does 
So I just highlighted a few of those. But the key attribute of any naval ship is reach. It can reach anywhere across the world, sustenance and endurance. That means it can stay in an area of interest for days and months together, unlike a aircraft or any other uh, military instrument. And lastly, any naval ship has flexibility and versatility. A naval ship today can be deployed for a diplomatic mission or it can be in a role for traditional security threat or in a role for a low intensity threat such as piracy or smuggling. So it is these unique attributes of a Navy which are contributing unheard of and silently towards our maritime security and maritime governance. Before I conclude, I would also like to, you know, quote uh, the noted naval strategist and historian Alfred Thayer Mahan, who rightly said in 1890, almost 130 years back, that whosoever controls the Indian Ocean will dominate Asia. The destiny of the world will be decided on its waters. And we see this unfolding today. We have many, many extra regional powers and nearly 100 foreign warships operating in the Indian Ocean because this is the highway of the world. This is where the resources of the world are. And this is where the power contest and the struggles for dominating the area are on today. Therefore, all of us sitting here in Pune, you know, far away from the coast, need to be aware of the fact that to be an ascending power, a regional or a global power, we need to build on our maritime capabilities and our maritime power. In this context, I'm sure that, you know, workshops which are being stayed by maritime research centers such as these will not only awaken the maritime Indian within us, but also enable us to harness the true potential of our maritime geography. In the end, I would like to once again thank Commander Das, the Maritime Research Center, and the Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence for giving me this opportunity to present my thoughts. And I wish all the participants of this workshop the very best for their future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It is certainly very reassuring for the citizens of this country. And what you said is definitely very, very uh, enlightening also. And also for the young generation, it gives a direction to what they should be looking at. Thank you very much, sir. I request uh, A.T. Ramchandani, sir, to kindly make his presentation. Distinguished members of the panel, distinguished members in the audience, uh, officers of the armed forces, students, and all members of the audience. Uh, a lot has been said about the importance of maritime dominance and maritime security, the relevance of a blue ocean economy, and all of that. And I would not talk about those aspects. I would give... Uh, the industry perspective and how we as uh, a private sector industry have been associated with all of this, uh, where we have traveled so far and how we see the future in this domain. Uh, to begin with, uh, at Larson and Tubro, we, you know, over the last close to 40 years, we have been associated with the Navy whether it is with aspects of shipbuilding, submarine construction, uh, weapons and equipment on board ships, and uh, now they're on into future aspects of uh, maritime dominance, which Vikram spoke about. So looking back, uh, you know, we've uh, had our shipyard that has been doing ship construction and when we created the shipyard, it was uh, 
meant to enhance the capacity of domestic ship and submarine building. Uh, we visualized it as a yard which would uh, be very modern and would transform the entire approach to traditional shipbuilding. Uh, we relied on uh, aspects of Industry 4.0 or what we call shipbuilding 4.0 and the introduction of a lot of digital technologies into shipbuilding. We realized that modern shipbuilding uh, can really exploit a lot of these technologies and uh, ships could be constructed in a very modular fashion, uh, outfitted in modules and then put together. So we built a shipyard with uh, a ship lift system capable of handling ships up to 20,000 tons and uh, decided to build ships inside workshops, quite different from the slipway and dry dock construction techniques. Uh, this enabled us to speed up shipbuilding and we have become close partners of both the Coast Guard and the Indian Navy in shipbuilding. Of course, private shipbuilding faces a lot of challenges in terms of uh, competition with the domestic public sector yards and there is a fair amount of capacity but given the future of expansion that uh, we would need in our shipbuilding assets we do believe that a yard like this has a great place to play in this uh, general shekatkar also talked about uh, you know the presence of uh, foreign navies in this uh, region and uh, we've we are today even servicing and refitting us ships in our shipyard today so that is the kind of uh, you know reach that we have created and i believe there are a lot of opportunities with this capacity that has been created submarine construction has been another activity which we have been closely associated with over all these years uh, being a close partner in the strategic submarine program of the Indian Navy. And uh, that has also enabled us in the industry to build a great amount of competency and capability, not only in the construction aspects, and where again we have uh, relied a lot on digital technologies, but also on various equipment and weapons aspects. This we have uh, done at a large scale for the Navy. So we've been associated with building many of the uh, engineering systems on board, whether they are propulsion systems or whether they are steering gear systems, uh, stabilizer systems, and so on. Uh, the, a good range of engineering systems. And uh, like has been said, because the Navy has built indigenous ships, it's given a lot of opportunity to the domestic industry to really contribute and be on board ships in terms of equipment. Another first that we did was to actually build weapon systems for the Navy and uh, we do supply uh, torpedo launch equipment, uh, anti-submarine warfare equipment and a host of other on board uh, weapon systems for the Navy, missile launchers, etc. And a lot of this has been indigenously built and it gives the Navy the fight capability with indigenous equipment. So uh, with investment in domestic R&D and uh, building of uh, these kind of weapon systems, it's enabled us to build capabilities in uh, uh, you know, the fighting capabilities. We've also uh, invested into uh, working on the sensor packages, which is both uh, naval radars and sonar systems, uh, being associated with uh, the active towed array sonar systems for the Navy, uh, various kinds of sonar domes for the Navy, whether they are in titanium or composites, as well as various naval radar, stabilized radar systems. So uh, the, all of this has given us a lot of breadth in terms of uh, the equipment and platforms that we are able to produce for the Navy. Now, moving forward, you know, uh, Vikram talked about uh, the importance of uh, 
tactical networks at sea, listening posts, and all of this, which are very critical for uh, maritime dominance. And uh, we realized that we would have to shift beyond just platform construction and equipment construction and get involved with aspects of CONOPS, with aspects of surveillance, reconnaissance, and all of this. Uh, there is a lot of trust in the new age uh, warfare and maritime dominance on unmanned systems. And this is something that we have started investing in. Uh, the industry in a broader scale, not only us, but many uh, parts of the industry are looking at working on various kind of autonomous and remotely operated underwater systems and uh, surface systems. And uh, we have also invested in these technologies because we believe that these are very crucial for underwater dominance. Uh, the importance of communication technologies, uh, you know, very low frequency communications required for sea, underwater communications, uh, are other aspects that we are beginning to invest in. The importance of networking, data science, autonomous navigation are some of the areas that we have taken up for R&D. And we believe that these are crucial for the future underwater dominance uh, that would be required. So given the uh, vast opportunities and the importance of uh, uh, maritime dominance, the large coastline, the large areas that we have to patrol and uh, dominate. I think the industry has a lot of opportunities, and we at LNT and I think the industry at large has seen this opportunity. They see that there are a lot of opportunities in the blue ocean economy, whether it is in deep sea mining, etc. And a lot of these technologies can be deployed for those purposes. So uh, moving forward, we would very much want to invest in these technologies. Uh, there is a big thrust on indigenous work in this area. So it's not about just uh, you know bringing in technology from outside and then deploying it here. A lot of the technology development is happening here. We are glad that there are uh, research organizations like the MRC and other think tanks within the country. We hope to engage with them in a much deeper way and understand operational aspects and integrate them into our industrial aspects. So broadly, that is the perspective that I have on this uh, subject. And for me, it's been a great morning getting a lot of insights into you know, aspects of maritime dominance. And uh, I'm grateful that a seminar of this type has been organized with a lot of breadth in terms of uh, spreading awareness on this topic. So thank you very much. I'll close here. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we are aware LNT is definitely very, very deeply involved at multiple levels, uh, right from SIP construction to the entire <coughs> indigenous equipment development. Thank you very much for your insights, sir, and we will be very, very keen to uh, work with you and work under your guidance. Thank you very much. I'll request Prafulji to kindly propose the vote of thumb. It's my honor and privilege to propose this vote of thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank General Shekatkar. It's, I've been very, very fortunate to have known uh, General uh, Sir for more than a decade now. I met him at a, uh, when I was making a presentation at the Indo-American Chamber on the choke points. So I mentioned the choke points, and uh, I was so touched by his humbleness and humility when he came and told me, uh, Mr. Thalera, I learned a lot from you today. I said, sir, what can I teach you? I'm just a, a, an ordinary Marwadi businessman who hardly understands. I, I got into geopolitics and uh, geoeconomics just out of sheer interest. And sir said, no, no, I learned a lot. Since then, I've been in touch with him. And uh, MRC has benefited immensely. Sir has been 
so kind and he's opened so many doors and opportunities for us in Delhi. Sir is uh, uh, an advisor to the Ministry of Defense and he has such a fantastic overarching view. I mean, he's not, he keeps saying that army men uh, are <laughs> dumb or something like that. I totally disagree with him. Sir is an individual who has got such a, you know, I always believe that strategy comes out of the big picture. And if you don't have a sense of the big picture, you will never be able to think uh, beyond so many things. Now you say like innovations are born out of out of out of the box thinking. Sir is a great out of the box thinker, and uh, sir, we are very very thankful for all your advice uh, when and all your guidance. Thank you, sir. It was very heartening to listen to Mr. Puri, who no who gave us a sense of how ubiquitous technology can be deployed such cost effectively. And Commander Das has been propagating this concept. I've been working with him for the last six years on how to create underwater domain awareness. Mr. Puri really very succinctly so well uh, laid out how technology, 5G technology along the network can be used to create this and how we can uh, close the gaps. Thank you, sir. It was very nice uh, listening to, I was very heartened to listening to Admiral Kocha. He spoke more like an economist and an environmentalist today. I'm so happy that the commandant of the NDA thinks in these ways. You know, I used to tell Commander Das when I met him that, you know, it's an idea. He, he got out of the Navy, maybe because he saw us, there are so many other dimensions to UDA, which he couldn't do whilst being in the Navy. So I used to always teasingly tell him that no Navy can stop an idea whose time has come. You know, it's, I mean, very, in a very lighter way, sir, nothing, no offense meant, because I really respect the Navy. I, I am one who believes that unless India becomes a Samudra Bharat, we cannot become a Samruddha Bharat. India can never achieve its potential unless we become a maritime nation. Like Sir said, India is the only country in the, ocean, in the world with an ocean named after it. Unfortunately, we got into our dark ages because we neglected our oceans. And now we realize the supremacy of the seas. Uh, and Sir also quoted Alfred Thayaman, you know, the person who literally wrote the doctrine of the US Navy. There's immense opportunity and I, I was so happy that I've been, uh, I'm the blue economic advisor. Sir, you said the color of the Amrit Kal is going to be blue. I fully agree with you. The, the color of the Amrit Kal, the next 25 years of India is going to be blue. The blue economy, we hardly, I mean, the uh, commander keeps saying that our contribution from the blue, blue economy is only 4% to our GDP, national GDP. Whereas, in the most advanced economies of the world, it's almost 20, 24%. So we need to use our blue waters far more efficiently. And there's a, an ocean of opportunity like uh, there, like the Navy says it. You know, there's a massive opportunity. And I'm so happy that you youngsters, uh, people attending uh, online, uh, the officers from the Navy, we are in a very sweet moment when we can shape the destiny of this world and realize our full potential. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ramchandani, uh, for your talk. Because I believe l and is a very, very good spot. It's a great company. And the largest multiplier, the economic multiplier, is going to be coming in for this country from the shipbuilding industry. As India achieves its potential, 20,000 kilometers of the national waterways are being opened up. The whole coastline is going to be opened up for transportation. I, as a logistician, have been working in this sector for the last 30 years, 30 plus years. And unless we can bring down our logistics costs by half, India will not be competitive. And the only way to do it is through the Sagar Mala, the, the whole uh, 20,000 kilometers of national waterways, and the coastline. This is the way forward. Thank you very much, every one of you. Uh, Commander Das, for all his pioneering effort. 
you know, I, I was so happy associating with him because he started this think tank with his pensions, pension money. You know, it, there's a lot of opposition from home, but you no, know, he believed in this cause and I believe in him. Thank you, sir, for leading MRC uh, so ably. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Admiral Varma here. Sir is the person who built the INS Aryanth. Sir was in charge 10 years. Sir has been very, very ably guiding us and he's a mentor to MRC. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And uh, I'd like to thank all the support, all the backroom support from MRC, for the media support from Symbiosis. There are students from who have come all the way from Cochin, all the officers of the armed forces, the engineering college, the indo Swiss Center of Excellence for having supported us. And least of all, uh, uh, not the last, but uh, the HT Parek Foundation to have sponsored this event. Sorry, uh, we didn't have much of a window. It is at the time of the year when students are studying for their exams, but we didn't have that luxury of time to choose when to have this. But it's been very, very nice having this workshop. I've been here for the last two weeks and we look forward to the third and the fourth week. Thank you so much, every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we'll take a break for tea and we'll assemble back. Thank you. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. 
that also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. Twenty-first century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The Indian Ocean region, 
IOR has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century, and various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning, MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the freshwater systems. The precise mapping of the resources, the quality and availability concerns of security and sustainability, and many more can really help in their effective and efficient exploitation. All kinds of policy and technology interventions can be deployed using MSP in vast marine and freshwater systems. The UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, and Nirthalani Technology Private Limited, NDT, is a unique concept to address multiple challenges and opportunities in the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific and beyond, the UDA framework has the technology-driven digital transformation at its core. Thus, MSP is better served by the UDA framework to manage the Indo-Pacific construct. Let's dive deep into what is marine spatial planning. MSP is a data-driven process of generating a spatiotemporal real-time appreciation of our marine areas to optimize the human interactions to achieve ecological, economical, and social objectives that have been specified through a governance process. The real-time MSP in the tropical waters require massive acoustic capacity and capability building given the suboptimal sonar performance. The mapping both on the surface and the subsurface require deep appreciation of the acoustic propagation characteristics to generate the spatiotemporal inputs. Along with that, the Environmental Impact Assessment, EIA, has to be inclusive, backed by detailed MSP construct. The ongoing MSP efforts somehow ignore the vast and deep underwater domain. The underwater domain awareness by construct require acoustic capacity and capability to undertake any kind of MSP. The cost of propagation underwater largely depends on temperature, density and pressure that impact the sound velocity profile. Building of spatiotemporal maps has its own issues. In terms of availability for inputs and providing actionable inputs for the diverse users, the diversity of applications and the other user requirements makes it extremely complicated to formulate the final forms of the deliverables. On the other hand, there is constant increase in stranding of big whales and the serious acoustic habitat degradation prevalent in the west coast of India. Hence, policy interventions are urgently required. However, in the absence of nuanced cause and effect analysis, such as interventions become difficult. The vested interest groups are able to build narratives that mislead the policymakers and local communities. In order to solve these issues, the proposed 2DA framework has multiple innovative contributions for real impact on governance and technology development. Number one, the huge network of AIS systems across the world gives us a very cost-effective means to scale up this model for the entire world. Number two, the addition of the local tropical underwater channel model is a big addition to bring focus into the tropical waters and the Indo-Pacific region. Number 3. The digital transformation with focus on acoustic signal processing will allow far more science and technology inclusion into policy interventions and governance mechanisms. Number 4. The International Maritime Organization IMO, has already taken cognition of the unique tropical characteristics and is now considering a regional framework. Number 5. The real-time data-driven and quantitative and qualitative analysis of local site-specific inputs will go a long way in building digital infrastructure for effective policy and technology interventions along with the caustic capacity and capability building. The regulators can monitor long-term sustainability impacts using various digital tools to derive MSP outputs. Micro and macro MSP tools need to be developed using digital and more advanced tools across the underwater region. A way ahead, the Geographic Information System GIS, based system have become very popular these days to manage the marine spatial planning, MSP based on the mapping tools for surface information. The comprehensive MSP is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean region 
IOR will require a nuanced approach. The UDA framework has discussed above can certainly enhance the effective realization of the MSP and corresponding governance mechanism for the entire maritime space. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The underwater domain awareness, UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest e magazine. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. 
introducing marine time research center foundation for underwater domain awareness the concept of the maritime research center i thought of as a technology driven think tank because i feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology and particularly when we talk about the indian ocean region there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain and uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed and that's how i thought of this organization where we are going to be talking uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development this going forward when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework it's going to be a huge opening and there is tremendous opportunity that are come going to come but to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things mrc is driven with a three pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness the underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders when we look at the underwater domain there are security requirements whether it is internal security or external security then there is the blue economic requirement there's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping undersea resources a whole lot of other things the third is the environment and the disaster management that also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively and the fourth is pure science and technology we all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come but specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very very important and that's how mrc tries to address the uda framework in a very very comprehensive manner MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation, and we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. they have a reasonably good understanding of the domain but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute so maybe you know stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain also we need younger people to come in i mean we have uh, say a computer science uh, student how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness or an electronic student how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness or even a law student uh, or a history student how they can bring value or a mass communication student how they can bring value so we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what how they can build a future career in this domain the 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the honorable prime minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Mini, inland water transport, multimodal transport, the deep sea mining mission, international seabed authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically. to play a leadership role in the region the tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources 
the economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. Thank you for listening. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. 
It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet manner. plan. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest eMag. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a co-
kindly settle down please Radhika ma'am thank you so much for joining us we'll start in 2 minutes ma'am sure sure sorry for not being able to come but actually no, not well uh, to still brave it and join us today ma'am thank you very much Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcoming all of you all once again, uh, distinguished guests and uh, audiences. We are gr uh, glad to have you back. Hope you all are refreshed. Uh, after a f very fruitful discussion in the morning, I think uh, let's keep our expectations as high. And uh, we have someone who will be joining us for the next session. Uh, She's very well known for her expertise in the domain that we all are very interestedly joined in. Introducing to you Professor Radhika Seshan. She's uh, also known for her contribution in the security perspective in the IOR. Radhika Seshan, uh, Seshan is a retired professor uh, who also was part of the Department of History uh, at Savitri by Phule Pune University. I would also like to say that she is also the author of three well-defining books that is the interest in all of our interests. Uh, her books are circling around trade and politics on the Coromandel Coast, which she released uh, and published on the, uh, in the year of 2012, Ideas and Instructions in Medieval India from 8th 18th century. This was published in the year of 2013. And the constructions of the East in West travel narratives, which was published very recently in the year of 2020. Ma'am, it's truly an honor having you with us. I would also like you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more of your field. Uh, over to you, ma'am. <coughs> Sorry. First, my apologies for not being able to join you in person. But as is rather obvious from my voice, I haven't been very well. So first, my apologies. A uh, brief introduction, I guess. All I could say about myself is that I'm a teacher and a teacher of history. And it's overstating it to say that uh, I have been concerned with maritime security in the IOR. It would be more accurate to say that I have consistently been concerned with forms of engagement, negotiation, and cross-cultural connections in the IOR. So let me move straight, therefore, into uh, the area that I was asked to speak on, which is maritime security. One of the first things to be remembered when we talk of maritime security is that there is historically, prior to the 18th century in the Indian Ocean world, there is no such thing as maritime security. Maritime security is a concern of nation states. So we have maritime engagements, we have maritime battles, a few of them, but security as we understand it today does not exist. Because security as we understand it today assumes the existence of nations and nation states. 
and those are very much a development in Europe from about the 14th century and in Asia only in the late 18th, maybe 19th century. We had kingdoms, we had uh, empires, we had transi empires as well. But the kinds of ideas that we put together as security do not exist. Security historically has always been handled locally by the local coastal communities who are particularly a threat from any kind of predation from the sea. I will not even use the word piracy because piracy too is linked to the notion of legality and sovereignty. And these in the Indian Ocean world came in with the Europeans. So one cannot really talk about maritime security. On the other hand, we can talk about multiple forms of engagement in the maritime world. And here we have in the Indian context, a long history of forms of engagement. So one of the earliest is probably in the seventh century CE, when the Chalukya emperor Pulakishin decided to launch an attack on the island of what is referred to in that inscription of the 8th century as the island of Puri. This is actually the island of Elephanta. And this is regarded as being the first maritime expedition, but it is not to do with security of the coast. It is to do with control of the trade that comes across the Arabian Sea from the Arab world, from the Persian Gulf world, so the Red Sea world, the Persian Gulf world, the Arabian Sea into India. So it is an attempt at getting into the profits of that trade rather than actually and what we today would call security. How this was received by the inhabitants of Puri, we don't know. Not surprisingly, the inscription doesn't tell us anything about the reactions from the mm. island. What we do know is that there is this very lyrical section in the inscription which says that uh, the sales of the ships that uh, he had organized were so large that they looked like the billowing monsoon clouds, except that the sails were white rather than the gray of the clouds. Allowing for poetic license, it still is apparently a pretty large armada that goes how it went, where it was built, who manned it, what were the concerns, we don't know. And as early as the 7th century, there is no doubt that these engagements were not using the ship itself as a weapon of war, not even having the ship loaded with different kinds of weapons. More likely, the ship was transport. So armed warriors who then were taken to the island, landed on the island, and then there was a land-based battle. The second major example that we have belongs to the 11th century, when we have the much touted example of Rajaraja Chola's major engagement across the Bay of Bengal to the island of what is referred to in the inscription as Kadaram, but basically to Srivijaya. It took a very long time to narrow it down to Nagapattinam as the point from which the Armada left. Again, inscriptions tell us lots about the glory of the king and the might of the navy, but it doesn't give us numbers. But what we do know is that having landed at Srivijaya, there is a land-based engagement again. The ships were probably marginally protected, but there isn't a clear idea of defending the land or attacking another land through the sea and with the sea itself as the arena of conflict. It is land always as the arena of conflict and it is primarily the land itself that is fought over. We then have perhaps our first indication of security which comes in the 13th century. This is the so-called Battle of Exar, which is off the coast of Burivli, and that was launched by 
probably the Shilahara kings of the Konkan coast, maybe the Katambas as well, but most likely the Shilaharas of the uh, coast, who, and here is perhaps your first idea of security that comes in. Because they said, the inscription again says that the creek near Exar was known to be the haunt of pirates. And therefore, the king equipped his boat ships in order to sail into the creek and to attack the pirate headquarters. Where the pirate headquarters is, how many ships, again, we do not know. These are among our earliest areas of some kind of maritime based engagement. But as I said, security is not, except in the last, when there is the issue of piracy, there is an element of the idea of security. This is broadly speaking from the state. On the other hand, we have, particularly again on the Konkan coast, we have a whole lot of hero stones a hero stone, a vehicle, is specifically a commemorative stone which marks a point at which a hero died, defending his land against some outsiders. Many of the hero stones along the Konkan coast give us pictures of boats. For those of you who are posted or who are near Goa or who have access to Goa, there is the museum in what used to be the Se Cathedral, and they have a large number of hero stones that they have collected and have put on display. Almost all of them have boats. We can see different kinds of boats. So we have the clear indication of predation from sea defended on land by some hero. No names, of course, but an idea of predation. Now, is this security as we understand it today? In one sense, yes. In another sense, no. Security, as we understand it today, is to do with borders, is to do with the preservation of the borders, is to do with clearly understood aspects of predation and aspects of defense against predation. And that predation is primarily seen as being by another nation state against one nation state. So, as I said right at the beginning, there is inherent in the notion of maritime security today, the idea of defense in national terms, not in terms of localized conflicts. This entire idea of defense, as I'd started saying, actually dates back to probably around the 16th century in Europe. And in many ways, the basis of the idea of defense is the 17th century text by Hugo Grotius, Grotius which talks about the Mare Clausum and the Mare Liberate, the open sea and the closed sea. So it argues that the idea of the open seas can exist in Europe where nations exist, where nations know their boundaries and where nations understand the importance of international law and all obey international law. This is the Mare Liberum. This is the freedom of the seas, but this is also the closed sea, because this is the closed sea where law defines the boundaries. And therefore, you have the second aspect of maritime security, which is that security is necessarily defined in legal terms. Legal terms would define areas of access, methods of access, and modes of access. And the understanding that a transgression, and the word I'm del deliberately using, a transgression of any or all of these is seen as a hostile action to be perceived as a threat to internal and coastal security, and therefore to be regarded in exactly that fashion. This, again, is a late development even in Europe. And therefore, I mean, if you look earlier, if you look at uh, perhaps the greatest of the uh, sailors of Europe, the Vikings, the Vikings never talked about security. They talked of raiding. 
So we have talk of the Dan Danish raiders, the Viking raiders, but the word that is always used is raiding. Raiding is not the same as security. These develop, well, two actually uh, points at which one can really talk about security from the perspective that we, so from the modern perspective. One is the Treaty of Tordesillas, 1493 where the Pope officially divided the world into two halves, north to south, with the western areas being only Spanish and the eastern areas being only Portuguese expansion. Now, this is your first official statement and official treaty, which lays a claim to the oceanic spaces. And it is a treaty which draws a line in the oceanic spaces to divide the landed worlds into two parts. So it is your first attempt at uh, partitioning the ocean. That can be seen as the beginning of maritime security. To this would come the next, which is 1648, the Peace of Westphalia. The Peace of Westphalia was technically just a land-based system because this was a treaty which effectively said that no country will interfere in the succession dispute of any other country. But it talked of the nation. So the Peace of Westphalia defined national boundaries. And to this was added Hugo Grotius and the conflict over access to new markets. The oceans, remember, are still not regarded as defined or closed spaces outside of Europe. So Mare Liberum in the outside world was also Mare Closum in the context of the countries that were fighting it out in Europe. So the Portuguese, for example, claimed that the Indian Ocean world was their world and it was therefore the closed world of the Indian Ocean, in which no other Europeans were permitted to enter. The Dutch in particular, and that's where Hugo Grotius' argument comes in, argued that this was also Mare Liberum because of the absence of any kind of international law and international system that operated in those seas. The idea of inherent idea in the notion of maritime security is the idea of sovereignty of the sea. And this begins to be asserted by the Portuguese in the 16th century. The Portuguese claimed that the seas were theirs because of the need for controlling the seas, but more to establish a monopoly on paper. There is the monopoly that is established not by conquest of the land, but by rerouting the trade and the ships that move across the Indian Ocean world. And here comes the next element, which said that if you buy the pass from us, then we will provide you security against the possible pirates on the sea. So security here goes back to the old idea of security in terms of predation not in terms of national security. 1534 comes the great attack on the Portuguese fortress of Diu, where there is a combined armada that is sent out by the Ottoman Emperor, by the Calicut uh, Zamorin, and on the land side by the Sultan of Gujarat. It was a failure, mainly 1534-1536 mainly because uh, the Calicut Navy never got out of the harbor. It was stopped by the, the Portuguese before it got out. So you get the next element of maritime tradition, which is of blockades. And the Ottoman is a different context altogether because the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire can, has learned about the aspects of maritime security and maritime warfare through their multiple attacks on the Mediterranean area. 
for example, the Ottoman attack on the city of Venice, which was a clear combination of Ottoman methods, Portuguese methods, and Venetian methods. And it is looked at as the first blockade by sea, because it is by sea, by warships, and by encircling the harbor so that nothing comes into the harbor and nothing goes out of the harbor. This is resolved finally by a treaty, but Venice suffers a major blow to its trade. This brings me to my last element of maritime security prior to the 18th century. Security here is seen still not in terms of the nation and nationalism and national boundaries. It is seen in terms of the protection of the arenas of trade by non-state participants, with the possible exception of the Dutch, of the Portuguese, sorry. The Portuguese establish a state-based system, and that state-based system is responsible for organizing the, uh, the caravans of the ships. They were called kafilas, organizing the nature of the security that is to be provided to the ships, organizing also the passes and making sure that the ships get passes only to from point to point so that the ship checks in at every port in order to get the pass to the next area of trade. All of this is part of that maritime world. It is to do with the monopoly of paper. It is to do with acquiring revenues from trade but it is not yet about attacking the traders as representative of a nation. This perhaps is best summed up by something that I have talked about very frequently, a letter of 1620, which is written by the uh, Adil Shah Sultan of Bijapur, who writes a letter to the Ottoman emperor saying that one century ago, you sent your troops to fight against the Franks now there are two other groups of Franks that have come in, all of whom claim to be lords of the sea. How can you be a lord of something that does not stand still? The sea is common to all. It is the land which is divided. Implicit in this is the idea of security as terrestrial boundaries, not as aquatic concerns. So what can be perhaps called a terra nexus, a nexus which focuses on the land rather than on the sea. So it is to the sea from the land, to the land from the sea, but it is the land which is to be secured, not the sea itself. These elements <coughs> become increasingly part of the maritime world of the Indian Ocean region. So we have, for instance, the uh, claim by the Kanur rulers, particularly with the uh, Gunyali Marakas, the, naval, the Navy of Kanur, the Ali Rajas of Navy, who claim to be regents of the sea. Note that they very often don't call themselves the lords of the sea, they call them the regents of the sea. So the regent is somebody who is in charge. So they are the ones who are in charge of the sea. They are the admirals, they are the kings. If you move to the 17th century again, we have a lot on the Konkan coast of the attacks of the Siddhis. The Siddhis based in the island fortress of Janjira attacked all along the coast, particularly the Maratha dominions. And in response to these Maratha attacks comes the first state engagement with security, the security of the land, with Shivaji establishing a fairly decent chain of coastal fortresses. We have the island fortress of Sindhudurg, we have Vijaydurg, also called Akhiria. We have the number of monuments that come up, the uh, smaller settlements, the attempt to target the, uh, <coughs> the uh, cities 
and when Aurangzeb comes up, he converts the Siddhis into the admirals of the Mughal Navy. So the Mughal Navy now emerges as a construct. Let me now move to a different dimension of security. Uh, somebody is speaking. Could I please ask whoever it is who is speaking? By the 18th century, Indians had begun to participate actively in the idea of maritime security. This was still, however, not deep blue, not the blue water security. It was coastal security. Perhaps the best example of this would be Kanhuji Angre, who establishes a strong navy consisting of primarily light and fast uh, warships, which were very often oared rather than mast masted and sailed because it was often faster to use the oars in the coastal water than it was to use the sails. There is this work by uh, Clement Dowling, who was one of those who was involved in, first of all, the uh, first engagement of the combined British and Dutch Portuguese forces against which I, against Kanpuchi Angre, then in the field, after that failed, then in the failed attack on the fortress of Gheria, which is Vijaydur. All of this talked about how there was a, there was a knowledge of the coastal waters. There was the ability to be able to use the oars and the bows and arrows equally well and to be able to have the marksmanship that the Europeans did not have, so that even in a uh, strong surf, the marksmen usually found their mark. So it is a combined sailing and fighting force that is on board the ship, oars as well as bows and arrows. So they could exchange at very short notice one for the other. There is extensive patrolling of the coast but again, the idea is not of defense. The idea is of claim to revenue. Where Kanhuji Angre says that the Europeans can claim to be masters, sovereigns of the sea, whatever they like. But there is no possibility of staying at sea all the time. It is necessary always to touch that land. And the land is his. Therefore, to get access to the land, they need to take a pass from him. In the same fashion that the Europeans demanded that Indian traders buy a pass in order to travel on the sea, Kanhuji Angri demanded that the Europeans purchase a pass from him in order to get access to the land, which in many ways I would think was a much more effective method. Because Whatever else you do, you have to touch base at land somewhere else. So we're back to the supremacy of land over sea. Maritime security as an extension of land security. Secure the land by patrolling the seas. No question of securing the seas to prevent access to the land. This is the essential dimension of maritime security prior to the 18th century. 18th century, and here I'm probably talking to those who are already well versed in this history, the Navy as we know it today has its roots in the Bombay Marine, established by the British, on British lines, on more accurately, European lines, and then used and developed to become the Royal Indian Navy and then the Royal Navy and then the Indian Navy. The progression, therefore, is through colonial rule and the multiple engagements prior to colonial rule, which then defined and put into place European notions of security, aspects of nationalism as defined in 
more rigid European terms. And in the creation of a nation state, the boundaries of the nation state, and the idea of the boundaries of the nation state extending into the waters as well. Eight kilometers, 12 kilometers, eight miles, 12 miles. All of you wish be far more familiar with Nova's details than I am. But this is your range of maritime security. I will, I think, stop over here and ask for questions. <coughs> um, uh, thank you so much. I'm extremely sorry. I'm feeling bad. Uh, you are it's unwell. Okay. And it's okay, which is why it's a shorter talk than I would normally have put in. No, no, no. Well, thank you so much uh, because uh, we had your first session and we were eagerly waiting for this session as well. And people who have missed the, her earlier session must definitely go into our records and uh, the video will be shared with all of you. So you must go through that as well. That was a different perspective on how traditional knowledge in India has been so rich and how that is still relevant in today's time. So please go through that. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if I can request you to talk a little bit on the, uh, the Ahom Kings and their uh, naval capabilities. Lasit Borfukan and on the river, basically also bringing the context of the river system. Yes. Now, while we talk of maritime security as being primarily based with this, concerned with the oceans, maritime security probably in the Indian Ocean world, in the Asian world, is much more concerned with the rivers than with the oceanic spaces. Rivers do exist. Rivers are a constant area of dispute and rivers also provide some of the fastest access that you can have. We have historically three major examples of the use of the Navy. Two of them concerned with North India and what we would loosely call Northeast India. The third concerned with South India. Two of them, therefore, are concerned with the Mughal Navy and the kinds of challenges launched through the Mughal Navy in the 16th and the 17th century, 17th century primarily. In Shah Jahan's time, early 17th century, when Shah Jahan was perhaps one of the most uh, active regents, um, Yuvrajas of the Mughal Empire, and when Jahangir was still the leader, leader he launched a series of attacks on Bengal to bring the rich area of Bengal under his command. As he went there, he discovered, and there was report after report after report, which says that the biggest problem that uh, Shah Jahan faced was that his people did not have enough knowledge of the riverine navigation or of the multiple tributaries of the lower Ganga area. And so when they narrowed in on an area which was a problem, they usually got there to find that there was nobody to fight with. They had already moved into one of the tributaries and were attacking the Mughal boats from the rear. This is perhaps the first example of a navy formally set up by a state. So it is a riverine navy. Initial is in the early 17th century. This then becomes far more important when, with Aurangzeb, they start moving into the Kamarup area, the Assam area. When they moved there, uh, one of the major leaders against the one of the the general, the major general of the uh, Mughal army into Kamarup was the former Prime Minister of the Golconda Empire, Mir Muhammad Sayyid Ardastani, better known as the Mir Jumla. Mir Jumla had a great deal of connection with the sea. In a minor tangential note, he had come in in the train of a caravan of horse traders by land, not by sea, from Central Asia into India. He stayed on in the Golconda Empire to become steadily first the tax collector, 
then one who had taken the auction of the uh, one area of land, it was called Ijara, he becomes an Ijarada. Then he uses the money that he gets from Ijaradari, the farm of the land, of the land revenue, to purchase a post for himself in the nobility, is appointed to be the administrator and the revenue collector at the Golconda Gold Diamond Mines, uses the money out of all of that to build up a navy and to purchase a higher post. And by 1640, he is reported to have uh, 10 ships of his own that sailed all around the uh, Bay of Bengal area. When he defected from Golconda and joined the Mughals, he continued to have his officers in the Golconda Empire who collected the money from trade. He directed them about the trading operations and continued to be wealthy. But with Mir Jumla, we get the first indication of an attempt to look at European technology because he lent money to the English at Madras. The English were perennially short of funds. So he lent money to the English at Madras and demanded that as repayment, they return, they give him one of the brass guns from their own company ships. He also demanded that that brass gun be fitted onto one of his own ships. And he demanded that uh, carpenters and shipwrights be sent in order to fit and to teach his people how to uh, use the same methods. This is your first example of some kind of an attempt at maritime force and the understanding of the ship itself as a weapon of war. What is clear is that he has an engagement with water and it is this expertise with water on a very broad scale that he brings to the Mughals in the entire region of Kamrup. He <coughs> studies, he's supposed to have studied in great detail the methods of navigation and boat building used by Lajit Barfukan. From the, unfortunately, the European records, because the uh, Burunjis do not give us enough information. The uh, Assam Burunjis do not give us enough information about the kinds of ships that uh, Lachit Barfukan concentrated on. But we do know that he had a fleet of small, maneuverable, and very fast boats, which, while moving downstream along the uh, Brahmaputra, usually hugged the left bank but they knew the currents and the points at which it was they were able to zigzag and to escape any potential art. These ships were not, these boats were not masted or sailed, they were oared boats because much more practical because something like the Brahmaputra has got so many concealed currents that to leave it to a sail and to the vagaries of the wind does not make sense. It has to be oared because it allows you a level of maneuverability that you do not normally have. Lajat Bharafukan reports, and this is from a French doctor who was with uh, Aurangzeb's forces, Reports vary as being anywhere between uh, 25 and 125 boats. Truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. That is that he probably had about 60 to 70 boats that could be used in various sections of the Brahmaputra. The rowers were those who belonged to the localities and therefore had intimate personal knowledge of their stretch of the river. So Lachit Barfukan was able to bring in local knowledge, local expertise, and his own engagement with the locality and the people in order to mount a very, very serious defense against the Mughal attacks. The entire attack actually finally collapsed when uh, Mir Jumla was killed. Post Mir Jumla, there were very few uh, people who had enough knowledge of the vagaries of water 
and far less knowledge of the problems of riverine navigation. So that entire uh, exercise effectively petered out. So the Mohal established its little bases, frontiers, if you like, the Golpara area particularly, but nothing very much. The rest of it became divided among a large number of local leaders, local kingdoms. What we do not get is any consistent engagement with the river after Lajit Burfuga. The river as an arena of navigation continued to exist. But the river as communication and the river as a venue for quick movements is something particularly in order to combat some kind of warfare is something that we don't find afterwards. So it becomes a specific and a very distinct epoch which uses the sea and the land and a combination of aquatic worlds and terrestrial worlds in order to defend both the river and the land on either side of the river. So the river then acquires a centrality as the life stream of the region because it does not permit outsiders who do not know the river to be able to engage with the river in the same way as the locals do. This, I think, has a lot of lessons for the UDA because we need to think about the locality, the local knowledge, and the local engagement with the rivers, which still continues. This then is the second. So the first is the Bengal uh, attack. They get up to the Sundarbans and they have tremendous trouble with the Sundarbans. Again, not surprisingly, Sundarbans even today is a navigational nightmare. And post-monsoon, we can't be sure that <coughs> the same streams, the same rivers in the Sundarbans will stay open. The Brahmaputra, the Tista, the Ganga, the Hooghly, the Damodar all bring down tons of silt. And in the course of, course of the monsoon, this silt is dumped and can block channels and can also open up newer channels. This is another area of local navigation. This was an area that the Mughals never entered. They got as far as Satgaon, but they didn't bother with anything more. Murshid Kuli Khan, when he establishes Murshidabad, brings in a lot of local expertise, but with people like Murshid Kuli Khan, with a whole lot of others, the orientation is towards land and the central Gangetic plain, rather than towards the mouth of the river and to the oceans. In that sense, we can say that what Murshidabad, Dhaka, Chittagong, when they come up in this period, are land-based polity which happen to be on water, not systems that are engaging with water in the same fashion that Lajit Barfukan did. Because Lajit Barfukan navigated both land and sea, a uh, land and water, with equal ease. That level of ease cannot be seen with the later ones. The third example belongs to the 18th century and belongs to Tamil Nadu, specifically another of the heroes, Veera Pandi Kattabomman. He was one of those that was in the Shivaganga region of uh, Tamil Nadu and launched a series of attacks on the British this is around the time and just after the second and the third Anglo-French Wars of the Karnataka. He used a number of local boats which were, which are defined in the Tamil literature as low-lying and uh, easily concealed in the shrubs and the overhanging branches and therefore very difficult to find. He used this internal waterway and here the waterways are not rivers. There is one river, but by and large, the inland waterways are canals. So the canals that were used for irrigation can also be used for transport. And Veera Pandil uses this very, very effectively to launch attacks on British installations, on British uh, soldiers, and to fight a guerrilla warfare through the waterways rather than through 
the hills and the land. This is perhaps the only example that we have of the waterways being used as arenas of warfare. These are your three major areas of the sea. Any other questions? Any questions from the audience? Okay, if there's no question, so I would like to request uh, Admiral Vodgaonkar, sir, to kindly uh, give his concluding remarks. Admiral Vodgaonkar, sir, I met him when he had just come to Vizag from Tokyo, and he took over Ranjit. He had few encounters in the squash court, sir. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> and then, sir, uh, <coughs> he is an aviator, and sir became a flag officer Goa area and flag officer naval aviation. And so, uh, somebody who has been part of the whole naval strategy formulation in, in multiple levels, and now, sir, is advising the Bharat Forge in how to steer the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, initiative. Sir, I request you to kindly give a concluding remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Arnab, for the introduction. But Arnab did not tell you that, you know, he used to beat the hell out of me in the squash court. That was a different story. Uh, Radhika, ma'am, thank you very much for a very incisive talk. Uh, going back into history where, uh, you know, the uh, oceans were clay feet and whoever uh, had the might ruled the oceans. Now, of course, things have changed. Over a period of time, United Nations laws of the sea and uh, maritime security has taken a different dimension. You're very right in saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, maritime uh, security is a combination of both land as well as the sea. And maritime security is basically a function of the nation. Obviously, when the nation is there, it's, it's the land which uh, has the sea with it and uh, has its own uh, connotations of uh, maintaining security. Uh, you went back into history and of course the interesting uh, thing, uh, point was our own prowess uh, in uh, the dimensions of uh, maritime Raja Raja Chola. He of course, you know all these people without knowing history had certain amount of vision and only after that probably Alfred Thayer Mann uh, Mahan said that the country that uh, rules the sea rules uh, the world and that's what the British Empire had actually done. The sun never set on the British Empire because you know they were ruling the seas. They had a huge armada and they had their seas all, uh, ships all over the world. They had colonized uh, a large part of the world and uh, so it is very important to be a maritime power and have prowess in the sea and as was mentioned earlier that there's so much of trade that goes through the water uh, that it is important to be a powerful maritime nation. You also talked about the Portuguese, I'm talking about the Chola, uh, Raja Raja Chola and the Portuguese because we were connected with them. The Portuguese of course uh, ruled uh, Goa for many many years till they were moved in 1961 but there again you know uh, they made insights into our uh, nation because of economic interests. Everything is economically driven. Uh, so there has been uh, adequate amount of transfer of technology, understanding the seas, and the whole dimension of maritime security has now changed. You can see China making a prowess because they have also understood that the Indian Ocean region is a very important region and to rule the seas you have to have a, a very powerful uh, navy. So thank you very much ma'am for your very incisive talk and despite your uh, uh, snuffy nose and uh, you still went through this educated all of us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am.
My pleasure. I appreciate you joining us in spite of your bad health. Thank you very much, ma'am. We'll break for lunch uh, and uh, we'll come back at 2 o'clock. We'll start our next session. Thank you so much. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, 
uh, or a, a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century and Various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning, MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the freshwater systems. The precise mapping of the resources, the quality and availability, concerns of security and sustainability, and many more can really help in their effective and efficient exploitation. All kinds of policy and technology interventions can be deployed using MSP in vast marine and freshwater systems. The UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, and Nirthalani Technology Private Limited, NDT, is a unique concept to address multiple challenges and opportunities in the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. The UDA framework has the technology-driven digital transformation at its core. Thus, MSP is better served by the UDA framework to manage the Indo-Pacific construct. Let's dive deep into what is marine spatial planning. MSP is a data-driven process of generating a spatiotemporal real-time application of our marine areas to optimize the human interactions, to achieve ecological, economical, and social objectives that have been specified through a governance process. The real-time MSP in the tropical waters require massive acoustic capacity and capability building given the suboptimal sonar performance. 
the mapping both on the surface and the subsurface required deep appreciation of the caustic propagation characteristics to generate the spatiotemporal inputs. Along with that, the Environmental Impact Assessment EIA, has to be inclusive, backed by detailed MSP construct. The ongoing MSP efforts somehow ignore the vast and deep underwater domain. The underwater domain awareness by construct require a caustic capacity and capability to undertake any kind of MSP. The caustic propagation underwater largely depends on temperature, density, and pressure that impact the sound velocity profile. Building up India is home to over 6%. of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy, technology and innovation, and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening, and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important, and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain.
also we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century and Various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning, MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the freshwater systems. The precise mapping of the resources, the quality and availability, concerns of security and sustainability, and many more can really help in their effective and efficient exploitation. All kinds of policy and technology interventions can be deployed using MSP in vast marine and freshwater systems. The UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, and Nirthalani Technology Private Limited, NDT, is a unique concept to address multiple challenges and opportunities in the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. The UDA framework has the technology-driven digital transformation at its core. Thus, MSP is better served by the UDA framework to manage the Indo-Pacific construct. Let's dive deep into what is marine spatial planning. MSP is a data-driven process of generating a spatiotemporal real-time appreciation of our marine areas to optimize the human interactions 
to achieve ecological, economical, and social objectives that have been specified through a governance process. The real-time MSP in the tropical waters require massive acoustic capacity and capability building given the suboptimal sonar performance. The mapping both on the surface and the subsurface require deep appreciation of the acoustic propagation characteristics to generate the spatiotemporal inputs. Along with that, the Environmental Impact Assessment EIA, has to be inclusive, backed by detailed MSP construct. The ongoing MSP efforts somehow ignore the vast and deep underwater domain. The underwater domain awareness by construct require acoustic capacity and capability to undertake any kind of MSP. The acoustic propagation underwater largely depends on temperature, density, and pressure that impact the sound velocity profile. Building of spatiotemporal maps has its own issues. In terms of availability for inputs and providing actionable inputs for the diverse users, the diversity of applications and the other user requirements makes it extremely complicated to formulate the final forms of the deliverables. On the other hand, there is constant increase in stranding of big whales and the serious acoustic habitat degradation prevalent in the west coast of India. Hence, policy interventions are urgently required. However, in the absence of nuanced cause and effect analysis, such as interventions become difficult. The vested interest groups are able to build narratives that mislead the policymakers and local communities. In order to solve these issues, the proposed UDA framework has multiple innovative contributions for real impact on governance and technology development. Number one, the huge network of AIS system across the world gives us a very cost-effective means to scale up this model for the entire world. Number two, the addition of the local tropical underwater channel model is a big addition to bring focus into the tropical waters and the Indo-Pacific region. Number three, the digital transformation with focus on acoustic signal processing will allow far more science and technology inclusion into policy interventions and governance mechanism. Number four, the International Maritime Organization, IMO, has already taken cognition of the unique tropical characteristics and is now considering a regional framework. Number five, the real-time data-driven and quantitative and qualitative analysis of local site-specific inputs will go a long way in building digital infrastructure for effective policy and technology interventions, along with the caustic capacity and capability building. The regulators can monitor long-term sustainability impact using various digital tools to derive MSP outputs. Micro and macro MSP tools need to be developed using digital and more advanced tools across the underwater region. A way ahead, the Geographic Information System GIS, based system have become very popular these days to manage the marine spatial planning. MSP based on the mapping tools for surface information. The comprehensive MSP is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean region, IOR, will require a nuanced approach. The UDA framework has discussed above can certainly enhance the effective realization of the MSP and corresponding governance mechanism for the entire maritime space. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, 
petroleum and minerals along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center MRC Pune progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UD Digest was emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UD Digest, the Mac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness.
The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is a blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Mail, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework 
at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the Underwater Domain Awareness Framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, new economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision through science and technology leading, artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role at the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. 
The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater domain awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level. India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest eMag. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is a blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. Marcy wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. 
we want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts across multiple stakeholders 
such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading, artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content 
so that we can deliver in a simple yet nuanced manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha, and I am the editor of the UDA Diversity Magazine. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <clears throat> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is a blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student. 
how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desilitation of the fresh water systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. 
UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate in the UDA.
welcome back <clears throat> so this is the last session of the workshop 2 we have been quite happy delivering whatever we could uh, it is all an effort of the team but also the various resource person i am sure you will appreciate we had the the topmost people, either domain experts, strategists, industry captains who have been extremely kind to us and they have taken time off from their extremely unimaginably busy schedule to come down. And I think young students need to take a lesson. Young students have not been able to make it on time, but the senior people with a very, very busy schedule have made it on time and we have tried to start the sessions on time and we have tried to make sure that we stick to time as much as possible but uh, as we I, as i said in the morning also it was a diverse set of discussions expert talks and also some of the specific projects that mrc has been working on we also tried to present that we are going to embark on the next series of workshop that will be in the summer school, which is more intended for the young professionals and the young uh, students and the faculty and researchers. So I will also request you to take note of that and please follow us on the social media or you can follow us on our MRC website also. All the information will be given there and uh, we'll be very happy to connect with all of you. And also I would request the senior people from the industry and various academia and other organization to take advantage of whatever we are doing and uh, it is also a platform to connect i mean we've been talking about user academy industry partnership can't be a better thing than this we had the commandant of nda in the morning a senior naval commander so he represents the user and he gave a fantastic lecture on what the indian navy is thinking and what not just the navy but the entire nation how it is looking at the maritime domain and how seriously they are looking at multiple aspects i mean there has been a policy push there has been a governance push on multiple areas uh, we had uh, uh, ram chandani sir in the morning representing lnt and sir has been <clears throat> i mean i would consider lnt one of the leading industry <clears throat> bodies today in india driving multiple aspects in the defense sector i mean they do a lot of work for the army but what we know uh, in the navy they are in almost every uh, area and uh, supporting navy in a very very different way so and also i think a lot of our uh, seniors uh, and a couple of my juniors i know are working with lnt so it is also a platform for nation building many people coming together and uh, uh, LNT is able to provide a platform. We also had Admiral Vardgaonkar, who is now uh, advising or consulting the Bharat Forge. So we have tried to bring different aspects. We had Mr. Vikram Puri also, who represents the smaller uh, groups trying to do innovative work and trying to support, because it requires a diverse section of people. We also have Rear Admiral Vikram Puri, sir, uh, he's been in the Navy for a long time and sir now represents the academia. He is the campus uh, director of DY Patil group and some of his uh, students and faculty are also here. So we all look forward to you to spread this message of underwater domain awareness and very shortly we will be releasing the proceedings of this workshop and we have tried to do it slightly differently this time. The concept note that you have it will be clickable. Every lecture is recorded. Every lecture will be available to you to uh, go through in your own time. And even they can be uh, used to uh, connect with the students and they can take advantage of this. <clears throat> we have uh, um, uh, additional director general uh, Vijay Safekar, sir. Sir has been very kind to me and MRC. We've been connecting with him. And even when he was still in service, he has been very gracious to uh, come and join us for one of our UDA summer school and uh, sir opened the door for the participants to get a feel of what the Coast Guard is and uh, his officers really 
gave a very, very good perspective because I think it is very important that the young students get an exposure uh, to what the possibilities are. The whole idea of such workshops are also peer learning uh, where these young students and young professionals can come together and build bridges. I mean, I think nation building will require a lot of people to come together and uh, take things forward. So we are very grateful to you, sir, for, uh, for being always with us and supporting us. Admiral Verma, sir, is here. Sir has been my mentor for more than 20 years now, I would say, and always guiding us and uh, supporting us in every way possible. And I would definitely once again acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, uniformed officers and others. Uh, I, I must acknowledge the Indian Navy for sending senior people. They have not sent youngsters, they have sent senior people and from very important organizations who are right now involved in policy making, technology interventions, and also an organization which looks at data analytics in a very big way in the Navy. So uh, the Naval Headquarters has been extremely kind to depute these officers for the entire five day workshop and they have really uh, <clears throat> taken a lot of interest and I mean, they are my, uh, uh, friends who, uh, who with whom I have served and I'm extremely thankful to all of you for having time out and uh, come and spend uh, uh, a complete week with us. Uh, officers from Army have come, they have spent five weeks, uh, five days with us. It's extremely important for from Marine Police also. Uh, uh, the IG was supposed to come but last minute he had to uh, uh, be available in Bombay so sir could not come. But we are extremely <coughs> thankful to all of you and Indian Coast Guard, of course, uh, they have also sent a very senior uh, officer and uh, a couple of more officers who have taken a lot of interest. And we want to build this connect uh, going forward. Uh, and we will be reaching out to all of you. And the young students, uh, you are most important for us. You are not only here to gain knowledge, but you are also here to understand where the opportunities are and how you have to prepare yourself to grab these opportunities and be part of the whole thing, right? So we'll start the session and I'll request Marisha to come. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope we all have had a good lunch and hope everyone is energized even as we move into our next session. So this is gonna be something that's uh, very exciting. We're gonna be having a panel discussion with our dignitaries. Um, on the topic of strategic security, challenges and opportunities. This is the topic that the panel will be holding a discussion on. I would like to invite our respected dignitaries, Sri Jayant Umranikar. All right. Uh, next ahead, we will have Vijay Ditsa Fekar, Sri A.T. Ramchandani, Sri Praful, Praful Talera, Sri Anis. Kanya to join us on stage and even as they join us on stage, please let's welcome them with a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, we will also have Amit Vikram, so who will be joining us on the panel as well. Please welcome them. Thank you. This is a panel discussion on strategic security challenges and opportunities. So it's a well-rounded panel. We have uh, uh, Jain sir. we're just joining, he's on the way. Uh, he was the former DGP uh, of police and he has been involved in the coastal security in a very different way. Uh, <clears throat> sir will be joining us soon. And we have Vijay Safekar sir, who was the additional director general in the Coast Guard has been part of the Coast Guard activities for a few decades. And uh, I have been interacting with Sir uh, for a long time and he has very different ideas and we'll uh, <coughs> be very keen to listen to Sir. Then we have Ram Chandani Sir, uh, LNT Defense, providing the industry support to the uh, 
whole defense and you all know defense industry today is and particularly the indigenous defense industry is being looked at very differently and we are eagerly waiting to hear his perspective we have uh, rear admiral amit vikram sir <coughs> uh, he represents even in the navy also he was looking at training in a very different way and sir will be looking at uh, and now he looks at the academy so sir will be giving a, a perspective on how the user academy partnership can really take things forward praful talera ji is a member of the strategic manufacturing uh, governing council of the strategic uh, manufacturing skilling a uh, skill sector and also the capital goods so he is somebody and he has been into the cyber security in a very different way then we have anish sir from cap gemini because whatever you may talk about digital india digital ocean that is one area which is going to actually impact the decision making itself whether we should go for it or not uh, because that is becoming one of the very very uh, critical uh, point where there is a lot of uh, fear whether we should really push it uh, in a manner that we would like to because there are several advantages but if we are not able to manage it well this can be a major uh, <coughs> challenge to deal with so i'll request uh, uh, vijay safikar sir to kindly give his opening remarks and uh, each uh, panelist i will request them to speak for about 15 minutes and then we can take questions from the audience thank you arnab for that introduction good afternoon ladies and gentlemen my background and experience is that of indian coast guard and uh, the job of the coast guard in a literal sense normally understood is coast guard to guard the coast and this session is about uh, strategic challenges and opportunities so there is a legitimate question which might arise as what guarding the coast has to do with strategic concerns and challenges well the job of indian coast guard or for that matter coast guards around the world is not on coast or along coast but seaward from the coastline and that extends to protecting india's maritime interests seaward from the coastline and that we have heard that maritime zones limit 200 nautical miles or uh one 360 kilometers from the coastline or around the islands measuring about 2 million square kilometers so he, this is the area in which the national interests are to be protected yesterday general khandar had mentioned while talking about comprehensive national power that and explaining on expanding on sagar vision that growth and security should go hand in hand now what that means is in this mandated area where we have to protect our national interest the legitimate users of the sea that is those involved in extraction of resources or exploitation of resources or involved in scientific research or the major users of the sea that is maritime transport this legitimate users of the sea should be reassured on one hand and at the same time the forces inimical to our national interest should be deterred if we do that then we can ensure say peace and stability and allow the economic resurgence what we are seeing to sustain so that is probably what yesterday was mentioned about allowing the growth and security to go hand in hand how well we have done this job till date and uh, as we know in maritime governance session also we heard that there are multiple stakeholders central and state agencies and so also the private sector which is involved in maritime governance and it is essential that all this agencies work in close coordination for a cohesive response to the challenges which i just mentioned uh, so the need of synergy and probably the panel which has been selected for this discussion is represents this diversity of multiple interests which are there in this task coming to how well we have done well uh, the threats to our national interest in maritime zones with anti poaching smuggling or uh, piracy environment threat to environment there is huge data to explain how well we are doing uh, when initial years of the coast guard the foreign fishing trawlers as far away from taiwan philippines used to come and fish close to our shores and then the series of 
anti-poaching operations and catching of those foreign fishing vessels. Until date, today we can say there is almost no poaching activity that happens in our waters. And that has happened after catching of some 1,500 foreign fishing vessels and some 13,500 roughly till last count foreigners, 13,500 foreign nationals who were subjected to the process of law, sent to prisons and then after serving prison, meant sent back to their respective countries. So that is how this anti-poaching exercise happened. As such, anti-smuggling, it has been seasonal or periodic. In 80s, there was huge amount of gold and silver smuggling. At one point of time, the value of total catch seized by the Coast Guard from those smuggling activities which were happening in the 80s was more than the value of the investment in Coast Guard at that time. So that was how huge successful. But what has been continuing and bigger challenge, which was mentioned earlier in a couple of by a couple of speakers, that is truck trafficking. And uh, we cannot, there's, even there is a value of that catch has caused in tens of thousand crores. We cannot really claim that in monetary terms because it cannot be really converted into monetary value. But the fact is that the concerns which was expressed yesterday also that this drug trafficking money goes into terror funding. In last 18 months alone of Gujarat Coast, there have been eight catches, drug, which in coordination with Gujarat ATS. So that, that is also an example of int and operational agency coordination with state government agencies and the central government agencies. And it is not just off Gujarat Coast, it has been another hotspot is Lakshadweep waters. And this has extended to the waters of our neighboring countries. And I'm very glad to say because that co cooperation, coordination with the neighboring countries has been successful that if those drug traffickers escape our waters, they are caught in the neighboring countries' waters. The resource protection in the maritime zones is the one part, but there is responsibility goes beyond maritime zones. Under SAR Treaty, India is required to coordinate rescue operation beyond our maritime zones, and that area is twice as big as our maritime zones, some 4.3 million square kilometers. And in terms of sharing our SRR body, search and rescue region boundary, we share that boundary with about 10 maritime states, including Seychelles, Mauritius, Indonesia, Malaysia. So what happens is that uh, not all these countries have capabilities to coordinate or respond to SAR missions in that area. But India has a very well-established SAR organization, and those SAR missions are coordinated 1,000, 1,500 kilometers away from our coastline, and sometime on request by the other states, which goes beyond our area of responsibility. And these operations are coordinated from a rescue coordination center in Mumbai, maritime rescue coordination in Mumbai. There are multiple nationalities involved, those requiring assistance or rescue and those providing rescue. So I would like to see this aspect from the context of the ability of the state to extend its influence deep into the sea. The another aspect which was there was the upsurge of piracy. In 2010-11, there are a lot of cases which occurred in the Lakshadweep waters and Navy and Coast Guard thumped it out completely. But there was a repercussion to that. Just because there are certain piracy cases occurred, the high risk area was extended much closer to our coastline on the west coast. It had huge implications to shipping insurance, running in hundreds of crores of losses, just or cost which was there because of that high risk area. Well, finally, at whatever level it happened, to restore that high risk area line away from our shores. But it could happen because we could generate a data that there is no piracy in Indian waters. And these are truly, as the Coast Guard at some point of time set a motto, safe and secure seas, and truly safe and secure seas, and there are no piracy cases. That data ultimately enabled us to see to it that that high risk area is restored back to where it was earlier, and at least the Indian waters are safe and secure. But I would like to highlight one case in the context of, again, what uh, contributions even a non-military arm can do to the strategic resources. There was a case, I'm sure some of you would have heard about the first part of it, but definitely the second part of it, unlikely that anybody would have heard about it. That was, uh, there was a 
Japanese merchant vessel named Alondra Rainbow that went missing, missing from Malacca Strait sometime in 1998-99. And that missing re report was sent to all the agencies around the world. Coast Guard also had that missing report with the description of the vessel. And one day, one merchant vessel passing some 100 kilometers south of our coastline reported sighting of a vessel of similar description. A Coast Guard aircraft was sent to investigate. Okay, coming back to that point, that it is about uh, incidents that happened in 1998-99 about missing uh, Japanese merchant vessel from Malacca State. It disappeared, never to be seen, found, and then missing report was circulated around the world. And one merchant vessel, say, about 100 miles south of Kanyak, 100 kilometers south of Kanyak, were reported sighting of a vessel of similar description, but with different name. A Coast Guard aircraft was launched to investigate. It found that the name of the vessel is not Alondra Rainbow, but Megarama, but that vessel refused to co cooperate in giving right answers. So the Coast Guard ship was diverted to stop and investigate. Again, that vessel did not cooperate, and it was beyond, we're not, it was likely to escape, or uh, 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 we're not able to stop that vessel. So naval assistance was signed, sought Navy, the naval ship disabled that merchant vessel, it was boarded, and it found that it was the same vessel which was missing. So normal, it is very normal that you done a good job of rescuing one uh, vessel, pirated it, and also got the pirate arrested, prosecuted, and put to process of law. But something else happened in this backdrop. This was in 1999, 1998, India did Pokhran too. Okay, and we went through difficult times the country was under sanctions, in the, even the military exchange programs were under sanctions. And in 2000, I was in Chennai that time, and there was a parliamentary committee visiting, headed by Defence Minister George Fernandes, and we were hosting that parliamentary committee. And I want to share what Defence Minister said at that time. This was in 2000. So, 98 Ukraine to 99 Alondra Rainbow, and 2000, this he was saying. And he mentioned the background of the difficult times we went during the sanctions. Then he said, recently I visited Japan, and he said, I received a red carpet treatment, and the point of discussion mostly at that time was that how this Alondra Rainbow was caught by Indian agencies and how there are huge opportunities for separation of piracy and cooperation, and how we can cooperate to secure shipping. This is, he said, 2001, Japanese side initiated a proposal for cooperative agreement for separation of piracy, regional cooperation agreement. And this was not just a cooperative cooperation agreement about information sharing, but it had some provisions like a right to enter in each other's territorial waters in pursuit of pirates. Obviously, initially there was a reluctance that this center's issue is about Malacca Strait and should we be part of that. But I can tell you, I was in Delhi at time when Japanese side were persistent that we should be part of this agreement. Well, that agreement came into existence in 2006, famously called the RIPAC, RECAP, with Information Center in Singapore. And as of date, just two years back, the executive director post of that RECAP Center is with India. So that is how, what I want to say, hard power is important. But we can't ignore sometimes a non-military soft power, which can make huge, com huge contribution to the strategic resources. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, <coughs> Jayant uh, Umrinika, sir, thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, we just started uh, uh, the first uh, presentation by, yeah, sir, the panel, uh, we are having uh, representative from different uh, areas, I mean, Safikar, sir, from Coast Guard, uh, you represent the coastal security and the, uh, uh, I mean, you've been part of this in a very big way. Then we have uh, uh, 
Prafulji, looking at the industry aspect, we have uh, Ram Chandani, sir, from LNT, who are the defense industry uh, supporting the various requirements. We have Rear Admiral Amit Vikram, sir, also. He has been part of uh, Navy for a very long time, but now he represents the academia. And also we have uh, Shri Anish coming from the Cap Gemini, looking at the cybersecurity aspect. So we had the first presentation by Safikar, sir, and I'll request you to kindly make your comments, and then we'll follow uh, the other. At the outset, I must apologize for being late. In India, you drive on the left side of the road. In Pune, you ri ride on whatever is left of the road. So it, we had to take a long circuit uh, to come to this place. Yeah. And normally, engineering college, I thought I would reach in 15 minutes. It took me 40 minutes <laughs> going around. Uh, what I suggest is since we are having panel discussion, I will just make some initial comments. And then afterwards, all the experts on their fields, they can uh, proceed with the topics. Then we can have question answers. If it is agreeable to everybody, then I think that's how we'll do. So these are just a few observations about uh, the topic today. That is the strategic security challenges and opportunities in the Indian Ocean. I would say that challenges and opportunities are interrelated. Many times the challenge gives you an opportunity and many times while exploiting the opportunity, you face many types of challenges. So these two are uh, very interrelated kind of uh, words. Uh, the Indian Ocean is a vast theater stretching from the Strait of Malacca and uh, western coast of Australia in the east and to the Mozambique Channel in the west. It encompasses Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea in the north, all the way down to the southern Indian Ocean. The land area is inhabited by almost 2.7 billion people. We have resource-rich Africa, we have energy-dense Middle East, and we also have South Asia, which is a big labor market, and of course our manufacturing industries. So the stability of the Indian Ocean is very crucial to the global economy. And what are the challenges as we see it? The first challenge is probably uh, competition, especially between India and China. And then there are also risks related to interstate conflicts. The second challenge is uh, terrorism, threats to the safety of uh, shipping, including as a consequence of maritime uh, terrorism incidents, organized crime, piracy, and armed robbery against the ships. The third challenge I see is uh, marine accidents and casualties caused by navigational shortfalls, use of substandard ships and equipment, and human errors. The next one is inadequate capacity in terms of maritime surveillance and search and rescue capabilities of the littoral countries. Then there are non-traditional threats, security threats, like uh, climate change impact, natural disasters, illegal fishing, drug smuggling, human trafficking, etc., etc. So these are the challenges that you're likely to face. I will add one more, and I will explain why. This is an internal challenge of governance, and that is government ad hocism and corruption. I would like to give an example here of what exactly happened, why I say that these are probably the biggest challenges that the Indians have. I was in service when 1993 bomb blasts happened, the serial bomb blasts in Mumbai. So as a reaction to that, we started what we call Marine Police today. And how did that happen? For that, I have to tell you one incident that happened in my life. I was posted in Patna. And on LTC, I had to travel to Pune. So I'd got first class tickets. I went to the railway station. I searched, I couldn't find the first class bogey there at all. So I caught hold of the TC. I said, Ki sahab, ye first class ka ticket hai. Lekin kahi hai nahi dikhai de hai first class ka. He said, sir, don't worry. He went to his office and he came back with a magic wand. That was a chalk. 
what he did is there was a second class bogey. He struck two and wrote one. He said, "Sir, up ke liye." So we created marine police more or less like that. There were some coastal police stations. Without even thinking whether the policeman posted there can swim, they were turned into marine police stations. So this kind of ad hocism, and even this discontinued after a while, and because of that, we had to face the problem of 2008, the terrorism attack on Mumbai, Taj, and all that. So this ad hocism has created huge problems. Actually, I was uh, hoping that Krishna Prakash will be here, but I don't see him here. He couldn't make it. Because I would have loved to know what exactly has happened to marine police and how they are functioning now. They might have acquired some boats, wagera, wagera, but I really don't know whether there is any infrastructure in place for marine policing, and this is something which really bothers me. Because if we don't pay much attention to this, it's going to create a huge, huge problem in future also. And the second thing is corruption. As I said, I was part of the investigating team of 1993 bomb blasts. There is a recorded statement of Additional Commissioner Customs, and it says, "Sir, we are also patriots. We did not know that they were smuggling RDF. We thought it is normal gold and watches. So you may have any kind of system in existence, but if there is corruption in the system, if the system is compromised, you are not likely to have any success. So from my my point of view." And these are the biggest challenges that we are going to face anywhere, and especially in the uh, maritime domain. Then there is one more challenge. There are diverse organizations that have evolved over time to address the maritime safety and security concerns at the sub-regional level. So harmonizing maritime governance may need an overarching institution that could synergize all these efforts and improve wider maritime governance and enhance maritime safety and security in the region. I would like to elaborate the uh, Chinese threat a bit more. Starting with anti-piracy operations, China has now emerged as a partner for the islands and littoral countries in the Indian Ocean. The Maritime Silk Road under Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative has provided an added platform to collaborate on economic and military issues. In 2017. Beijing set up its first overseas military facility in Djibouti, on the Indian Ocean coast. Now, France, Japan, and USA already have such facilities in Djibouti. India is the primary partner for Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, and Seychelles. France is the key partner for French-speaking Madagascar and Comoros, but China is the only one which has diplomatic missions and presence. Across all these six island nations, then as part of its far seas operating philosophy, China is in possession of Sri Lankan Hambantota, where for developing a port and special economic zone, they have given out huge loans, and now Sri Lanka is in a debt trap. Maldives has received generous aids from China, and. again it's a feature of so called debt trap policy that china follows and since maldive represents a buffer zone surrounding india's maritime strategic space we have to be very careful about uh, chinese encroachment and that is of again a very serious concern to us although the present maldivian government is a bit sympathetic more sympathetic to india but we have to keep a look out what could be the solution as i see it india should look to develop interdependencies with neighboring countries both economically and strategically india has settled its disputes maritime disputes so far only with one neighbor and that is bangladesh there are maritime disputes with everybody else now what are the opportunities in the indian ocean region indian ocean uh, oceans basically are uh, new economic arteries the oceans as global highways of connectivity have been the principal means for propagation of political social cultural economic and military influence the indian ocean has the potential to become the most important resource of new global growth as its channels carry two thirds of world oil shipments and a third of bulk bulk cargo and half of all container ship traffic 
the importance of trade and the sheer scope of its many subregions make Indian Ocean very critical in terms of military and strategic engagements. It's a vital trading hub connecting the Middle East to Southeast and East Asia, as well as Europe and the Americas. Any disruption along its trading routes will impact the entire global energy security, let alone that of significant economies like uh, China, Japan, and South Korea, which depend on energy imported primarily via Malacca states. Interestingly, and I think uh, the Navy people might be in a better position to explain this, uh, Admiral A.T. Mahan was a firm believer in control of the sea, saying that if you want to be a big power or great power, control of the sea is very important. From that point of view, if you consider the SLOC, sea lines of communications in the Indian Ocean, of the world's seven key choke points for oil transportation, three are in the Indian Ocean. The first choke point is the Malacca Strait between Malaysia, Singapore, and the Indonesian island of Sumatra, which connects South Asia and the Western Pacific to the Indian Ocean. The second is the Straits of Hormuz, which is the only sea passage connecting Persian Gulf to the wider Indian Ocean. The third is the Babel Mandeb Strait, which flows between Eritrea and Djibouti in the Horn of Africa and Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula, connecting the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. And finally, in the fourth one, there is also the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and Mozambique, which is a key trading route for goods transiting the Cape of Good Hope and the Middle East and Asia. So, if you want to have security, you have an opportunity of emerging as a naval power which can influence all these check choke points. And I'm told, again, the people from the Navy might be in a better position to say that India itself is structured in such a way that it's an unsinkable aircraft carrier in the triangular shape of India. So we are at such a strategic position that if you want to, we can definitely have huge influence and that will present a big opportunity uh, for India in the uh, maritime domain. Uh, in fact, Peter Zaihan is one of the proponents of this theory that Indians are probably going to control the trade in future because of the unique position that uh, Indian uh, subcontinent occupies. I just want to add a few statistics about the Indian coastal line and I will stop. India has a 7.5 thousand kilometer coastline. There are 12 major ports and 187 minor and intermediate ports. Recently, the Supreme Court has given some powers, extra powers to the police. In the past, we had no power to investigate anything that happened on the seas, actually. And that was one of the constraints we faced when, when we were investigating the 93 bomblas as well as 2008 bomblas also. The Supreme Court in January 2013 order in the Italian Marine case, gave limited state police jurisdiction to investigate offenses which were confined only to territorial water, that is 12 nautical miles from the shore. And central agencies had uh, jurisdiction beyond that up to the exclusive economic zone, that is 200 nautical miles. In June 2016, the Union Ministry has issued a Gazette notification invoking the territorial waters, continental shelf, exclusive economic zone, and other maritime zones act. This is the big name of one act only, of 1996, to empower 10 police stations located on both east and west coast to investigate any offense committed by any person between EEZ. So the scope of investigation of the police has been expanded quite a bit, but it is confined to 10 police stations. Now, as I said, my only worry is that if we continue with the ad hocism and if we only react to a situation, then maybe we may not be able to meet the challenges or take advantage of the opportunities which are available to us in the Indian Ocean region. Now, after this, I would like uh, my fellow panelists uh, to give, say, 10 minutes talk on their, their uh, topics of specialization. And who would like to start first?
प्लीज so i'll just use a presentation as a backdrop to make the so uh, i'm going to talk about the industrial dimension to this whole thing and uh, you know i'm from lnt and uh, part of the private sector industry which is now actively engaged in defense and security the whole thrust on atmanirbharta has brought the industry to be very actively engaged in the defense sector and uh, it has also encouraged industry to make investments in r&d and to build our own products and to build our own solutions for security so of course a, a company like ours we've been associated in supporting the navy and the coast guard we build a number of uh, offshore patrol vessels for the coast guard interceptor boats high speed interceptor boats etc in our shipyards and these are uh, being effectively used by the coast guard for coastal security we are also into ship building and weapon systems for ships and uh, that forms part of the traditional navy but uh, the presentation that i am going to talk about is that uh, there is a big thrust on uh, underwater surveillance on underwater awareness and uh, the industry is now gearing up to provide these solutions uh, today's technology also looks at unmanned systems and the use of unmanned systems for uh, surveillance for mine countermeasures and for a host of other activities so we are actively engaged in all of this and we believe that this does contribute and provide opportunities for uh, future security requirements so what you see on the slide is a number of unmanned vessels that we are working on and these are different types of platforms with different capabilities which can be integrated with different sensor suits and uh, weapons and can be made uh, suitable for this kind of uh, maritime security and this is a kind of road map that we are following for developing these platforms they are all being indigenously developed so that we have control on this uh, the future that we see is that uh, finally we would need to have a network of sensors and different kind of uh, sensors for the awareness which are linked up and uh, with uh, advanced communication and linked with a lot of data processing so the downstream data processing to identify threats etc is a big area where lot of work and we see lot of startups etc working in these domains so just to tell you that uh, pretty much uh, various nations are following similar strategies and there are different classes of unmanned underwater vessels which are being used uh, ranging from the extra large you know the which have uh, endurance running into maybe a month or so to the very small vessels which can be man portable and can be deployed for specific missions and this is pretty much the approach that we as a industry are also following so what you see here are some of the vessels that the us is building and uh, what you saw in the previous slide was our approach 
to the same thing. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity also. So when we talk about opportunity, these are some of the programs which the Indian defense is now wanting the industry to produce. And what you see is a whole range of unmanned systems, be they for mine countermeasures or for ISR or for anti-submarine warfare. And a uh, lot of them are coming under what the Indian MOD calls make to, or which is that the Indian MOD says that we will buy these platforms and these solutions and the industry should invest and develop them. And India should own the IP rights of these products so that we are not dependent on any other state for them. So these are a whole range of products that uh, are being now, uh, you know, contracted by the MOD and for which development is taking place under the make to by various industries, including ours. And uh, the, in the, the MOD has also started an IDEX program, which is an innovation for defense excellence. And they are supporting startups to build a lot of these solutions. Like I said, a lot of the solutions involve data processing, signal processing, and data analytics. And India has a lot of capabilities in this, I would say, to, uh, for us, that's an opportunity, and we can really build good systems with good downstream data processing, which will enable us to be alerted of various threats that could be there. So these are some of the products that we are working on. This is an expendable underwater target. Of course, this is uh, an underwater platform which can be used as a target. Uh, for various kinds of uh, naval exercises. Uh, then we have acoustic targets, which are again used for, uh, you know, seeing how effective our sonar systems are. And uh, this is another platform that we are working on currently. Then mine, the same platform is being adapted for mine countermeasure role. And uh, that's a variant where uh, different sensors and for uh, diffusion of the mines, uh, different uh, effectors are fitted on the same platform. This is the same platform used for an MCM survey vessel. And then this is a larger unmanned underwater vessel which has a depth rating of 500 meters and can go up to eight knots. It can be fitted with different payloads and for different applications. And uh, this can be launched and recovered from a naval ship as well. So as we go on this, we are working a lot on uh, different kinds of autonomy because all these platforms need a high level of autonomy. And uh, from what is a somewhat scripted autonomy where you tell the vessel how it has to travel to an intelligent autonomy. A uh, lot of technology is involved and these are some of the technologies which we are working on at the R&D stage. So to sum up, I would say that the industry is actively engaged in looking at the application of technology for uh, you know, security and uh, coastal security applications. Uh, if you ask me for the challenges, I think uh, while the capability exists and there is a lot of excitement and people are doing a lot of things, the need to integrate all this into effective solutions, to have the right concept of operations, to have the interaction between the users, the Coast Guard, the police, and the developers and industry, probably requires a very good integration network and probably uh, organizations like NMC, et cetera, could also facilitate that to bring together, uh, you know, different stakeholders on a common platform. So I would stop there and, uh, you know, these are some of my views on this. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Admiral Vikram, sir. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, make some caveats because it's not a right time to have a panel discussion because in the beginning, uh, the organizers said that some choice lunch was served. So I'm not sure how is the attend how's the acceptance of all of us uh, uh, at the desk. Uh, respected chair, uh, fellow panelists, uh, Commander Navdas, um, Rafulsa, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy uh, to see the white uniform in person uh, after about two and a half years from the time I retired. So thank you so much for uh, naval presence here. I, as I see the, the as I uh, take a clear of the, the audience, I think there are a large number of uh, uh, students as well. Uh, and I know for sure that, of course, as per the direction from uh, Commander Das, uh, I have sent uh, some of my students here, including the faculty. Um, at the outset, let me thank, uh, thank uh, Commander Das for giving this opportunity to be part of this learning session. I call it my, for myself. Um, I would like to compliment him for taking this initiative because I am your ardent fan for that matter, because even during uh, COVID times, um, I have been following both of you, sir, because you have been on almost every session through webinars and all. Um, the kind of initiative which uh, this MRC has taken is phenomenally big. And when I was asking where is the office, he said, Ki, I operate from home. So that is like even beyond that. I'm very fortunate that I had a chance to now meet uh, Vice Admiral DSP Sharma, uh, whom I have seen in my younger days as an icon in the in the service. Um, there is, um, um, I'm not sure as to how much I link it up with academia, with the fact that uh, there is a need to create awareness. In fact, when I uh, see my campus where I today uh, represent as DY Patil Education Complex Ak Akudi, where we uh, provide uh, education from KG to PhD in uh, wide streams and specializations, having 14,000 students, having our international university within campus, but when I talk about Navy, even pronunciation of the rank is at times difficult. So that is the sense of awareness about armed forces or uh, Navy for that matter in the civil world. So I'm taking that mandate uh, at my campus that I correct that how do you read my rank first? Um, some of the facts which uh, Chair brought out uh, in terms of uh, uh, our uh, standing as a maritime nation. Uh, there is no denial of the fact that we qualify to be called as maritime nation because uh, we got 7,500 kilometers of coastline, 1,380 uh, or more islands, 2 million square kilometers of EZ. And there's no denial of the fact that um, the trade routes today, uh, which uh, the chair mentioned as sea lines of communication, actually are the same from time immemorial. Even maps indicate um, that you in 250 BC, for that matter, ancient trade routes were between Alexandria and China were the same uh, in the Indian Ocean region. And of course, were governed by the winds and the uh, monsoon patterns. Hence, relevance of Indian Ocean is, uh, in my opinion, time immemorial for the point of view of the global economy. There is also no denial of the fact that uh, despite having the professional Navy under the rules of Shivaji Maharaj uh, in the 17th century for very rule for about 100 years uh, in the same this in this region of the of the nation of ours and having 65 odd ships and 5000 odd trained men of that time and that era and then of course followed by the colonial uh, lineage of our navy um, the prominence of indian navy uh, came very much in the time of uh, admiral verma sir time um, you know, when we had in uh, 1971 Indo-Pak War. So the whole security perspective earlier was pivotal around the land boundaries. And I remember when, uh, whenever in the early stage of my uh, naval life, which I served for more than 35 years, um, uh, when we were we used to sit in, in Maritime Warfare Center or any of these uh, spaces, they used to give us a slide which used to have the Indian map ulta. And used to say that read now, Indian map in this perspective that, you know, you are looking towards sea. So that was, I think, the beginning in, um, in probably uh, late 80s or early 90s. And uh, uh, 
Uh, today, of course, the Sagar vision, which has uh, been the, the mandate given by the Honorable Prime Minister in 2015, um, the strategic vision is now changing. And the um, entire perspective of engagement, rules of engagements are changing, which I'm sure in this five days must have been very widely covered and, and uh, deliberated uh, by various uh, speakers who are the experts in their own domain. So in my uh, perspective, the IOR has taken prominence in diplomatic engagements and it has become a, 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 a forefront in the, uh, in the foreign policy. Of course, India has taken pledge uh, through this to be supportive of uh, multilateralism and having collaborative capacity building through networking. And uh, that's why uh, we are very prominently calling ourselves that we are the, we are the first responder in crises and of course, we are the net security provider as a nation. Um, if, you, if you look at it uh, about uh, 10 to 15 years back, um, um, when the doctrines were being uh, drafted and, uh, and brought it out, um, USA very conveniently ignored India as a, as a, as a nation or the, as a maritime nation in the, in the doctrine in 2015. Uh, Australia ignored us in 2010 very conveniently. Of course, they brought it out, the aspect of Indo-Asia-Pacific, but they didn't mention India as being, a, despite the fact that geographically we had a centrality in this particular region and we had our own strengths. But today, of course, things are different. Uh, uh, the G20, uh, we are having the chair. Uh, Japan is having uh, G7. Uh, Indonesia is, of course, having ASEAN chairship, chairmanship, and so on and so forth. So, the two maritime institutions which uh, took prominence um, and brought uh, um, the focus on us is, of course, 1997 Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, and, of course, uh, the IONS, uh, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which me and Chapikar sir had a good fortune that uh, we were doing higher command course at that point in time uh, from at Mumbai, and we were part of this uh, this opening session at Vigyan Bhavan in Delhi, where 27 countries took part. And uh, this was like a, a regional forum with uh, exclusive naval chiefs sitting from uh, the friendly foreign navies. And of course, this number has grown. I think today it is more than 35, and it is growing every every time, every every two years, because there's a regular engagement at, at various forums. So under this uh, backdrop uh, of this Sagar vision, um, maybe I would like, I may be repetitive, I'm not sure what has happened in the morning uh, with the audience, but uh, assuming that uh, I am probably first time talking, I take a chance. So the, uh, the five uh, um, important points which came uh, from the from the vision document, or rather vision statement of the uh, Sagar vision, and which is supplemented in uh, the subsequent uh, two uh, addresses of, by then Raksha Mantri, uh, Dr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Nirmala Sitaraman, in the Indian Ocean Conferences, which happened uh, in 17 and 18, she uh, not only re-emphasized re on the aspect of uh, the Sagar vision of the, uh, the Prime Minister, but also added an additional dimension of uh, regional connectivity. So I would therefore uh, like to put forth uh, the challenges and opportunities because that's the, the, that's the uh, mandate for this panel discussion, uh, keeping the Sagar vision uh, as the main theme. Uh, the first, of course, security is the, is the inherent uh, word in the acronym Sagar. And uh, that remains the main challenge, which even uh, Chafikas have brought out about their piracy uh, uh, as a big, 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 big uh, threat, which of course is in check today. And of course, uh, so there are non-traditional, traditional threats, uh, both uh, we require to probably attend to under this mandate. Uh, as brought out uh, by the chair about 2011, uh, 2008 Mumbai attack was a root shock for the nation. And in fact, was a wake up call. And I, I happened to be at Western Naval Command then in Mumbai and I remember that uh, the, uh, the FOMA organization uh, came up and got geared up. And in terms of, we started making a physical connect with the coastal community and started to uh, bring in the first link as to how do we uh, get to know as a first input. So that was, I think, uh, 
the start, as even uh, Sir mentioned, uh, in terms of, uh, and of course, then the, the subsequent developments happen in terms of uh, marine police. And today, uh, uh, having the, such a wide and vast uh, coastline, it was not possible to physically and manually manage. And today, in my sense, technology has prevailed and it is continuing to grow um, and rather adding up with time. And um, there is a strong coastal security network which has been set up and all the, uh, uh, the MOCs at, uh, at various uh, prominent locations in the Indian Navy are connected with joint operation centers, GOCs, and a large network of radar stations and uh, are giving feed to uh, the, the, at a central location at Gurgaon called IMAC, where the entire thing is aggregated and analyzed and then given feedback to both the uh, Coast Guard and the, and the Indian Navy. So um, there is, I think, a better networking in terms of flow of the information. The infrastructure of island territories is, of course, being improved uh, at every stage uh, uh, through the Island Development Authority. That is the next uh, push, uh, because as I said, we've got large number of islands. And so both the strategic uh, islands of Andaman, Nicobar, and um, the Lakshadweeps are being addressed in terms of not only strategic uh, point of view, but even in terms of giving uh, better job opportunity for islanders and the improving the tourism. Um, INS Kwasa, which has been set up in 19 at uh, Andaman, North Andaman, uh, as a coastal surveillance point because of the strategic uh, uh, kind of, uh, reach, or rather uh, having nearby Indonesia and the close distance between the two. Um, similarly, uh, large number of uh, infrastructure improve, uh, change happening in terms of um, the uh, the Lakative Islands as well in terms of air strips and detachments and so on and so forth. The entire naval, uh, naval focus of deployment is shift in terms of mission-based deployment. And that's the reason that uh, we are having a constant patrol in all the areas and we are in a, having anti-piracy on a check. HADR has been very uh, successfully used from Navy perspective. And we recently saw in, during COVID time when we had uh, a diplomacy through um, sending uh, the medicines and uh, and uh, medical aid and so on and so forth to not only littoral states but even far distances, and that 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 proves it that we are the first to reach uh, when there is a crisis in any part of the of the globe, and of course we recently saw the way it happened in Turkey. Uh, the next uh, aspect of the capacity building, uh, which was the next as uh, dimension of this uh, Sagar vision. Uh, in my sense, uh, it is in a big way happening for last many decades. I take, for example, the point about uh, uh, we training uh, personnel uh, from large number of countries from the time probably I joined the Navy. Sri Lanka, Bangladesh were time-tested uh, friendly and neighbors, friendly navies, and we had we have got continued number of. Uh, but yeah, of course, over a period of time, we are reaching with more and more navies. Um, not only, of course, in uh, our in the Indian Ocean region, but even uh, African continent as well, uh, both officer level and the sailor level. So uh, that ITC program of government is a very time-tested uh, tool of uh, having uh, a connect with the uh, with the uh, with the for the friendly foreign navies. The uh, we have got an organization called FOST at uh, Kochi, which looks after the operational sea training, uh, readiness of the ships. From that, in that perspective, and of course, we have not only that organization not only looking after the Indian naval ships, but even ships uh, from Malaysia, Seychelles, and Mauritius. Mm, um, refits again, we undertake refits, uh, especially like Mauritius. In fact, one point in time, we were even manning their ships. We are operating them and putting the refit uh, in our uh, dockyards. Um, we are helping uh, our uh, uh, littoral states friendly little states in terms of setting up the training centers, um, giving them uh, the, uh, enhancing their surveillance uh, missions, uh, assistance towards that. And uh, of course, we are not trying to, that it's a mandate is very clear that we don't put as a military uh, purpose based the way probably US and UK did in the, in the 19th century, but it is mainly keeping the, the sentiments of the local populace and the, and the government intact, we are trying to assist them to that they become, um, their surveillance becomes better and uh, the, 
which is in, not only in terms of just um, the asset building, but even providing them the, uh, the naval assets in terms of FICs, boats, OPVs, or even the air assets. The third dimension, which was of uh, collective action, um, is in terms, in my opinion, what the MRC is doing in that is maritime domain awareness is one of the key factor of the Sagar vision, which uh, I again, as I said, I compliment uh, MRC for creating this mass awareness and bringing it even now up to college. Because I've seen some programs which Commander Das has done in the colleges, and I will request you to also come at my campus as per your convenience and educate our, our students uh, on these aspects. The, the uh, IONS uh, is a very potential uh, platform and is growing from strength to strength, not only in terms of conducting the meeting, but even having now uh, exercises. Uh, um, in fact, the last exercise which happened to, in 2022 uh, was having a large number of uh, nations uh, both participating or being observers, and which happened off Goa. So, um, as I said, the technology is coming in terms of integrating uh, various agencies together globally, and uh, Infusion Center, which has come at uh, come up uh, uh, at Gurgaon, is the one which is actually having uh, the entire flow of information, um, and that is being used to perceive the threats. The 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 fourth dimension, which is of the Sagar, is the sustainable development, and uh, in this aspect, I would like to say that of course. Uh, the blue economy, which comes very uh, prominently and significantly, and there are challenges in uh, attaining uh, uh, a good strength in that. Uh, so in terms of marine, bio te marine biotechnology or exploration of uh, uh, beds or for that matter fishing, or, uh, or rather uh, illegal fishing that to, uh, in the deep seas is a challenge which uh, we require to really take uh, uh, measures for. The climate change, which is like uh, COP27, was uh, there are some global uh, mandates which have come, and there are some timelines which have uh, which have been set for for ourselves by various nations, and of course we are much much ahead in its uh, uh, in in its attainment. Uh, I would say that uh, global warming, rise of sea levels, uh, disaster like tsunami, etc. To 2004, tsunami was a big shock to all of us, and then of course uh, as on today we got an early warning system in place. Um, and of course, we saw the amount of devastation which happened at the, uh, in uh, 12 countries uh, around us. The fifth aspect uh, of the vision, which is like maritime engagement, is, uh, uh, as, as I said, it's like ever increasing with time. Uh, we are having both bilateral and multilateral exercises. Uh, the last million 2022, which happened, had the participation of about 40 countries. Uh, that signifies that the importance which Indian Navy is attaining vis-a-vis -vis the, the foreign cooperation which is happening, happening with, with India by various, various large number of countries. IFR, I happen to be, I was privileged to be part of that in, in, while I was posted at Vishakhapatnam headquarters in 2016, where we saw international fleet review which happened, and um, um, a delegation of about 50 navies came, which is again a very, very significant milestone from Indian Navy perspective. So military engagements would uh, would be a part and parcel of this aspect of giving a push towards this uh, this, uh, this Sagar vision. And the last point, which, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Singh, uh, uh, Sita Raman, she brought it out while she was Raksha Mantri about the regional connectivity, is again, I think uh, she would have probably given this aspect, keeping the PRI in intact, the border, the Belt and Road Initiative with China was giving a, a great, great uh, thrust at that point in time. And uh, to give that uh, a counter, she probably brought that regional connectivity aspect. And today, of course, large number of projects which are there uh, in pipeline, um, Sagar Mala project, we, uh, we talk about the road connectivity, we are, what we are seeing uh, in, in our nation, are all bringing it in terms of how do we, um, how do we uh, integrate the flow and the trade. Uh, inland uh, waterways uh, are getting a, 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 a significant push in terms of uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Vietnam. In fact, that reminds me that, you know, of late, uh, we are now having a, a great amount of, uh, uh, great amount of uh, uh, synergy in terms of training the Myanmar cadets, uh, both uh, and officers and sailors, and similarly, we are, uh, our officers are going and training uh, 
uh, the, the at Vietnam in their academy, our officers are, are permanently posted to train uh, their cadets. The, uh, so, uh, in this aspect, of course, uh, uh, there is a, as I said, there is a, uh, there is a constant uh, uh, push in terms of uh, uh, creating the port infrastructure. Uh, Gangavaram port uh, at uh, uh, at Vishakhapatnam is a is a very very latest and absolutely modern uh, deep sea port, uh, one of its best in class, I suppose. So, with this, um, I would like to uh, conclude that. Uh, in the navy in my personal uh, uh, gauge has helped uh, the nation in attaining uh, the mandate which uh, prime minister gave through uh, sagar vision and uh, uh, in a uh, we have got a great great focus uh, uh, in terms of cooperation with the little states in the indian ocean region under this sagar vision thank you and jai hind Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> I'll request Anis, sir, to kindly make his remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. That's great. So I know everybody has taken lunch, and there are our panelists who are coming and sharing their amazing experience. Thank you. Dr. Kamanda Das for this opportunity. So let me uh, bring more energy uh, to this session. Uh, I know everybody is going since morning, a lot of presentations and good, amazing insights. I was going through the amazing uh, uh, workshop day. So that was the topics are very, very nice. That is amazing. And it's a great opportunity at the time in front of you. Uh, thank you, our senior leaders and for their inspiring, uh, amazing journey and uh, uh, the, the kind of thoughts and uh, 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 amazing insights which you are sharing from your experience. Thank you so much. So uh, I know I, I have been given 15 minutes. Uh, uh, let me uh, share some of the amazing stuffs. I don't have a presentation, but I would like to uh, share more experience, personal experience, as well as the current security challenges that we have and what are the opportunities as well as uh, how uh, safe we are into the current uh, threats uh, and uh, what we can do to safeguard ourselves from cyber uh, criminals and the organizations which currently uh, facing the during situation current situations every organization is facing a lot of challenges with respect to security and i am being a CISO, uh, and my, my every friend or working in every organizations in army in navy everybody has some kind of challenges with respect to the technology that we are using and the current uh, way of working to and moving towards modern digital world so uh, before i come to on my topic uh, let me uh, put uh, uh, let me have this session more interactive so everybody is charged up and I, I i want some of the insights from from everyone so let me ask you one question that how many of us how many from this audience how many of you are not using mobile anybody okay so we everybody is using mobile okay great how many of us are not using internet no one okay so we have, everybody is using internet okay now let me ask you one more question how many of you using android device okay i can see 70 80 percent okay remaining is i think maybe they are using apple devices right okay how many of you using think that ios device is more secure okay there are few words thinking that okay there is some security in ios device definitely yes but nothing is secure in this world let me tell you right so how many of you heard last week one incident with respect to one of the financial bank uh, where some of the uh, data that has been available on the dark web anybody has heard about any incident okay so there was some 7.5 gb of data 
for one of the financial bank. It was not bank, it was a subsidiary of the financial services. Uh, there was allegedly the data was available around 7.5 GB of data was available on the dark web. And this uh, data which has all the personal information of the, of the customer, it has uh, the personal information with respect to the loan, their uh, date of birth and other information. That is all the PII and SPI information that was available. So, so let me ask you one question. How many of you think that what is the trend of cybersecurity incidents? Any thoughts about uh, the kind of incidents and what is the occurrence in minutes, seconds? Any thoughts from anybody audience? Yes. Uh, it's being reported. Reported. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But what is the incidents that has been reported? Incidents that are being reported. Some get leaked, but uh, most of them are not reported. Okay. So let me give you one insight. Every six to seven seconds, one incident that is being reported in the across the world, okay, where data has been compromised and data has been leaked. And that has been reported by every, every security professionals and, and the kind of companies that are who are monitoring those and if and there are some websites online which i can uh, i cannot show it to you right now where you can see you will see the real time incidents that is happening across the world okay just like uh, it's being in seconds and sometimes sometimes in milliseconds also so it depends right so each and every organization who are implementing the tools and technology even though there are chances of data leak and and any any thoughts why the data has been leaked what are the challenges or what are the gaps that we can see anybody from any thoughts from anyone okay good any other Absolutely. Absolutely, sir. Very rightly said. Yeah. Right. Which is uh, 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 being aware or being not aware? That uh, data is being uh, utilized or it has been compromised by any individual who is sitting in any part or corner of the con uh, world, sir. Absolutely. Enough, sir. Yeah. So the data has been compromised because of the gaps and the vulnerabilities in the systems. Anybody want to share any uh, other points? So why this vulnerability exists? Absolutely, correct. So do you know how many vulnerabilities being reported in last one month? If I can give you some statistics about between 15th of February to 15th March, how many vulnerabilities that has been reported? Yes. Not million, uh, it's more than 2,000 vulnerabilities. And uh, however, there are millions of threats uh, and alerts that has been generated in every minute, right? So the organization who are monitoring their infrastructure, where they can see the threats and the kind of uh, attacks that are happening on their infrastructure, right? So this vulnerability which I am, I'm coming to that point that around 2000 plus advisories being released by this OEM with respect to the Microsoft cloud platforms and other technologies, right? That, that, inc that includes the database where we are storing all our critical informations. So now coming to the 
vulnerabilities. How many of you know what is zero day vulnerability? Anybody? Anybody has heard what is zero day? Siri, sir. Absolutely. So zero day vulnerability, which is being reported in, in devices, in our systems, the reason for zero day, the vulnerability has been detected, but we don't have any patch to apply. Okay, the patch is yet to release. However, the systems are already compromised. By that time, when we go and detect, by that time, millions of systems has been compromised. So the zero day vulnerability is another pain and another challenge for every CISO and for every organization that includes the zero day vulnerability. Now coming to the 2000 plus vulnerabilities that is being the vulnerabilities reported, the advisory is being released in out of the 2000 plus, 837 are critical. Critical means you have to patch within 24 hours. If you are not going to patch, the system will be compromised, right? So there are organizations who are patching it immediately, but there are some organizations who will take some time to patch. And this, if, if they are de delay in the applying the patches, the systems are getting compromised. So these are some of the challenges. Now, how many of you are using Windows XP at home? Okay, good, nobody. Anybody Windows 10 and upgraded to Windows 11? Very good. So I can see, and I'm happy to see, otherwise sometimes when we ask to the audience, there are many users who are still using Windows XP and there are many organizations who are still going, continuing with Windows XP and there are some legacy systems which they are using, which is highly risky in the organization and all this data, because Windows XP and other technologies are end of life support and where we need to upgrade our technologies and we need to upgrade our infrastructure. We need to ap apply the latest patches that are available in the markets. Now coming to the uh, mobile devices, anybody using more th less than five, around uh, five, more than five years old mobile phone? Good. If you are using, then you are highly into risky because your data can be compromised anytime where I'm not asking you to upgrade the infrastructure. We as a personally, what, whatever we are using our personal devices, we need to ensure that the systems are being updated. Our device is being upgraded and we are also using the latest mobile, including the latest Android version and the latest iOS version. Why I am telling to you? Because these are the high risk holes where the cyber criminals or the bad actors are targeting to the organizations. They target through, the, through phishing, they target through social engineering attacks, they target to phishing type of attacks. And 87%, where Sir has mentioned, 87% of the, of the attacks are from human. Human means either through social engineering, through phishing, or any other type of vulnerabilities that exist in the third party or in, in any of our devices, right? So now, Coming to my another point, uh, you have received in last one month, anybody has received any message on their mobile that uh, uh, please submit your KYC document, otherwise your bank account will be closed every other day, right? And how, how you are detecting, how you are analyzing that, yeah, this is a legitimate message or this is something which a phishing message. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Correct, correct. Absolutely, sir. So, there are different type of tactics being applied by the cyber criminals, and it 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 covers phishing, whaling and other so social type of engineering attacks. And every day they come up with a smart idea of phishing, okay? And not only phishing the, uh, sending the phishing emails, messages, uh, also they are targeting the senior officers from the army, from senior officers from the government and senior officers from the organization, CEO of the company, where they send some phishing emails 
and then then targeting them to up upload some of the transfer some money or uh, or providing them some link and that link contains malware you, you know how many of you know malware anybody can describe malware yes yes software which are used to uh, basically exploit your data and absolutely to maybe plant viruses wonderful wonderful so how many of you know what is what is the number of days this malware exists in your system any guesses it's more than 60 days and sometimes it's more than 100 days also and sometimes the organization are detecting the malware after one after one year after 200 days or 300 days by that time the cyber bad actor has stolen all the informations and transferred those information on the dark web for sale right today today in the dark web whatever the credit card information that we have those credit card informations are available in 70 rupees per card in the dark web and in the international cards are available in five five dollars so this kind of data that has been leaked and uploaded on the dark web for sale and now coming to an important point the challenges that every organization is being is be, has, has been faced and they are facing anybody knows about ransomware ransomware right so you have heard about ransomware so ransomware is another type of uh, bad hacker activity so when you do some malicious activity that is happening in your systems so how it enters so they enters from third party software they enters from phishing they enters from the vulnerabilities that exist in your systems and then they put the malware into the systems and that with that malware they are targeting your internal infrastructure they target your active directory they are targeting your critical infrastructure they are targeting your customer personal informations and then they steal all this information only thing that is being happening because the systems are not not patched the systems are not updated with the latest patches that we have it is not secure and we are not monitoring our infrastructure so these are some of the challenges because of the legacy infrastructure that exists because of patching activity that we that we don't have and we don't have proper monitoring systems and when we are monitoring when we are deploying some tools and technology we also need to ensure that we are doing the right configuration and we have the monitoring in place to ensure that we are detecting that alert and that then we are we, we, we identify that okay what is the infrastructure what kind of alert has been generated by this tool and and then we need to take appropriate containment and mitigate actions to resolve to identify that threat and then if that ip is being targeted then we need to block that ip so there are tools available in the markets today which does through ai ml they do it automatically but at the same time the security analyst needs to identify and go and deep dive each and every alerts right because the malware that exists once the malware is, has been entered into the systems the cyber criminal can easily do the lateral movement from one systems to another systems and they are compromising slowly your entire informations and then after in one time your hundred plus or thousand plus servers are locked once you will start it will give you a prompt i think you have seen the prompt what kind of prompt that your system has been compromised and then you have to pay ransomware in bitcoins and you if you need to unlock and if you need some files transfer this money to this account and then we will unlock your systems so there are organizations which are currently facing lot of ransomware attacks and the reason is that the systems are not fully secure and that includes the last systems also there are big enterprise there are small enterprise there are manufacturing units there are pharma units and and you have seen all these organizations including the governments also they are being targeted for ransomware attacks and secondly 
how many of you think that okay if we transfer the money through bitcoin or so we will transfer the money to them the system they will uh, the system will be released and then all the files and all the data will be given to back to us nothing you will transfer the money nothing will come to you so the only thing that we have to do is we need to restore and restart our systems restart means not the restart you have to any you have to re restart from everything from the scratch so you have to reinstall your systems and to reinstall your systems you need the data and if you don't have the data then you can't do anything so here the important point which i would like to express that what why data is important and in case of any type of attacks the important point is that we need the backup and we don't have the backup then we are nowhere our com company information that we have they, we, if we are storing the data on the cloud if we are storing the data into some systems in another backup systems even the the threat actors even when they do the lateral movement first they understand that okay what kind of network you have which are your active directory which are your critical accounts what are the passwords and then which are your critical information which contains financial informations your financial transactions everything they understand and then then they target all those attacks and they even know that which are the systems which they we are keeping the backup so the backup which we are storing even they will whatever the backup stories that we have they will also target those systems also so even you won't be able to store the backup from the available storage so here the backup is also required not even on site you need off site backups you need backup at outstation locations then only you will be able to to restore and come back to the normal situation once we are targeted for any ransomware type type of attacks so these are the real challenges and scenarios of in today's situation and it is not going to end okay so it is going to continue and there are in, there are also insider threats what is insider threats there are within the organization within the employee who are also being involved into some of type of malicious activities also so the organization also monitoring the insider threats and each and every activity of the employee and that's why the tools and technology being deployed uh, into the organizations how many of you know dlp what is dlp is data loss prevention tool and what this tool does it it detects any type of data that has been transfer either through email either through usb device or either through through outside external world that has been detected and that has been reported to the management that okay this kind of data that has been transfer over gmail or that has been transfer over usb device or that has been transferred to cloud so these are the tools which every company is now going to is taking and putting that kind of controls and before that we need to have the data classification policy because now today's situation if we don't know data what is my data and what is the classified of this data this data is for public this is for this is for my internal organization that is my confidential data or this data is being restricted because because of some of the contractual clause that we have now for army for our navy all these are very very confidential and restricted data because all these data are being being there for the nation so that's why this data is very very important and for that we need to have the data classification and our data needs to be classified then only we can have this data prevention tool which we are installing and putting it and it is nowadays this data classification tool is also being available in the cloud and each and every organization is also monitoring now coming to the next part of uh, phishing we discuss about phishing uh, we discuss about social engineering okay how many if i can ask you one general questions how many of you seen that your instagram or facebook account is compromised anybody no one okay 
So how many of you are using two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication. Yes, yes. Very good. So I can see around 30-40% employees, our, our, our team is using two-factor. So here, uh, before I move on, I know I am exited 15 minutes. So let me uh, give you uh, one important point and take away for today's uh, workshop that please, please, please have two-factor authentication in all your social media accounts, including your bank accounts and including the organization accounts where every where once ever one and and you know what are the current uh, sweet passwords that we have sweet passwords means abc123 password p a s s w r d sorry date of birth admin at the rate 123 taste 123 123 4 5 6 7 8 admin admin password 123 if you can do google top 10 passwords you will find password at the rate 123 password 123 and so on okay and you know if you are keeping this password in your systems official systems or your social media accounts or bank accounts the bad guys they can crack the passwords in how many seconds microseconds there are tools which are available free. They can install and they can crack this password within milliseconds, milliseconds. It will not take at least one second. So the takeaway which I'm going to share that always keep 14 character password. 14 character password means I'm mentioning that it should be strong. It should have special characters and we, we should use numeric and alphanumeric passwords with special characters. Don't use your personal name or something like that, right? Keep a strong passwords and also don't use the same password for all your accounts, official accounts, personal accounts, okay? Keep 14 character password, special characters. Also use two-factor authentication in your, in your social media, other official accounts that are, that are very, very important to ensure that the because passwords are if you can study some of the research okay more than 18 percent credential thefts the that cyber incidents being reported more than 18 percent are because of credential thefts and why this is happening because we are not storing the passwords into the systems which are uh, which are encrypted passwords are weak or password being shared or sometimes password are also being kept similar password for all other accounts. So these are some of the challenges and some of the threats that everyone is facing, not only for their personal bank accounts or social media accounts, even at the organization level, because, because employee is the first line of defense. And the cybersecurity uh, uh, responsibility is not a CISO responsibility or is not a security officer or senior officer. Security is everyone responsibility, right? And with that, we know that, okay, roti, kapda or makan, everybody says, right? You have heard about. I will say that roti, kapda or roti, kapda, makan, internet plus security should be, should be the, the next way of journey for all of us. Thank you so much and thank you everyone. Thank you, Anish, sir. It was definitely very important. Prafulji, your comments, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Anish Manghania. The very interesting to know this. Now, I just want to share with you, uh, Mr. Hemang Jani was with us last week, and we took him for a small trek on Betal Tekri. And during the trek, we are talking about the dark net and all this. Mr. Hemang Jani is the Secretary, Capacity Building Commission, uh, reporting directly to the Prime Minister. So all the 30 million babus in this country, every government servant, uh, is under the Capacity Building Commission. 
so he was uh, just sharing this incident with us he was working with the world bank uh, in washington dc and he says i used to pass by this huge uh, building there called the veterans uh, building and they used to process the the salary uh, the pensions of the american veterans and he says i used to pass by and used to wonder why they have such a big building but and then i read in the newspapers one day that uh, one of the three guys uh, three fellows working in the veterans three veterans working there itself they had formed a clique and uh, even after some veterans had died they would keep them alive and uh, siphon off the money the their pensions and they created a huge stash of funds which uh, and they were living it up they were having a ball they would go to las vegas and really having a good time and how it got detected was that sitting there in washington dc they ordered a mini submarine on the dark net they ordered a mini submarine on the dark net and then the cia got after uh, got onto this case and the cia was wondering who is ordering a submarine from washington dc on the dark net and that's how this whole thing was detected and caught you know see i i was part of two delegations to israel one was for cyber security and one was for homeland security and mind you i was really scared after visiting all the installations we went to i i visited pegasus and like you said that you can you know where we went one of the the institutions there uh there's this huge screen uh, on the wall which was monitoring cyber attacks in real time like you said every few seconds there were attacks and uh, like russia being targeted the uk china iran india is the fifth largest target of all the targets in the world india is number 5 we are target number 5 and i was really scared after that i came and asked <laughs> she is hey, please be careful what is happening with our systems what is it so see cyber security and uh, homeland security that that was re- a really scary experience you know i've been interested in geopolitics they say the global commons so I mentioned global commons you know the three global commons one is the blue waters the international waters the second is outer space and third is cyber space see we in this country have to some extent and to a very large degree in fact work with outer space but these two are the commons the blue waters that includes the underwater domain and cyber space are almost unaddressed you know this is a huge threat as i see it from my little experience i am not an expert on anything but the underwater domain that's the blue waters and cyber space we need this country needs to have a like kamanda has been advocating a whole of nation approach uh, uh, mrc wrote a paper for uh, the niti ayog that we should put have a whole of nation approach the whole all the resources of this country should be put into these two domains for ensuring our security no because going forward data is the new oil and if we can't process the data if we can't i mean data is literally you are dumb if you can't make anything out of data the knowledge has to be called out of the data and how do you do it how do you build those capabilities even in the morning someone said that if you uh, how do we connect all the data which all lying in fragmented pieces all over in so many institutions so many companies so many organizations if you can't connect the data and make sense of it we are in big trouble going forward so see i work in the uh, i've been part of the strategic manufacturing sector skill council i am on the governing body and uh, all the defense P- psus the ordnance factories all these big defense establishments come under that and we were wondering how to build the skill sets in these domains now that sector skill council has been merged with the capital goods sector 
Now, India wants to be in the top five defense hardware exporters in the world. So how do we build Industry 4.0 into these domains? That's a big challenge. I am sure companies like L&D, sir, Ramchandani, sir, mentioned that Industry 4.0 is being really very well deployed in L&D. L&D is our own Lockheed Martin, I would say. <laughs> so what I would like to share here is that working in the logistics domain, you know, your logistics supply chains, everything, I mean, the most catch, catchy phrase which we see is your logistic, you know, the COVID has exposed this. Your logistic supply chains are as strong and as resilient as your cyber securities. If you are compromised there, just imagine if, you know, logistics is a military word. And if your supply chains in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force, in so many, even for corporates, if they are compromised, where are you going to be? One chink in the armor, and there you go for a toss. So now when I went to Israel, they told us that more than one lakh malware, more than at that point of time, I mean, a few years back, being released every day, every day, more than a hundred thousand malware is being released, being created. There's a lot of innovation happening there. So now how do we counter this? How does one, so it's a huge challenge as a nation, as, as an organization, as the armed forces, as a company, everywhere, at, even at individual levels. How do we build capabilities to counter this, to be, how do we remain alert to such threats? You know, we as uh, the Maritime Research Center, we have been doing our little bit, well, over the last six years, we've been taking baby steps and uh, trying to build capacity in this domain. So we, you know, uh, this acoustic capacity building, which Commander keeps talking about, how do we build? Because there's not a single institution or not a single college in this country which teaches acoustics, uh, sonar. You know, there is sonar for how to design a hall, maybe just from an architectural point of view, but how do we deploy it underwater in so many other domains? Sonar is basic to everything underwater. Everything underwater you can't perceive, you are blind without water, uh, without, without a sonar, without sonar capabilities. And 70% of the world is water. We know more about outer space than down there, what is there underwater. So you can imagine the gap there. It's a humongous, massive gap which needs to be filled. I'm very happy that students have taken out time here today to attend over the last two weeks. So this is a domain which has got a very bright future, which is drawing attention of all the decision makers in Delhi. People are taking note of it at the Niti Ayog, at the NSA's office, in the Defense Ministry. And we were very lucky that we could go and get uh, convince AICT to start 10 courses in acoustics. Uh, now they have declared 10 courses. Uh, the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Yojana also has approved of uh, 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 these norms which we have created for skilling. So there is a lot of possibilities. There's a huge amount of opportunity. Uh, and I hope you will be our ambassadors to take this message across to your institutions, to your colleges, and spread the word about underwater domain awareness and the skilling required. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Profulji. In fact, Profulji was telling me when 2008 he went in the CIA delegation on cybersecurity, being a logistician, how come he is part of a cybersecurity delegation? I mean, I think we can keep criticizing the government, but there is, or the larger systems, not just the government, but every large system has its own way. But there is a method in the madness, and you can also, I mean, you can imagine in 2008, what was the understanding of cybersecurity? But he, as a logistic person, was part of that delegation and 
many of you, although you have spent so much time with him, he won't have told you. Their company is doing the logistics for the Sukhoi and various very, very big projects. So if they have to, logistic has to get into defense or the defense logistic has to be managed by a private entity, security or cyber security will be such an important area. I mean, they are pioneers, their company, uh, Siri sir is also here, their company is a uh, pi uh, pioneer in getting the whole uh, uh, inventory management uh, into the logistics in a very, very big way. I mean, they are, uh, they got the just in time thing. So there are so many dimensions. Anisa, thank you so much for creating this awareness. I think it is very important that all of us really understand the different, I mean, many of the lectures that you see in this whole workshop series, somebody may say, I mean, uh, defense or any other uh, sector, what is the relevance of history? You heard, ma'am, uh, today she was not well, but uh, even then I could draw so much from that. So there are so many dimension, whether it is nation building or policy, it is so important or governance, it is so important that you have a 360 appreciation of things, various factors can influence uh, governance or they can impact governance and we have to be really aware of that. I'll put a quick question to all the panelists. How do you see the capacity building going forward and how do you see an industry uh, uh, user academia partnership in uh, maybe a little specific to UDA but in general sir uh, your comments. Uh, we have a very well balanced panel. We have uh, 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 the panelists representing very uh, specific and but at the top level, uh, starting with Anis sir, your views on how do you see the user academy industry partnership, your inputs, because we will be uh, uh, taking note of your inputs and we'll be reaching out to the, uh, the government and the senior decision making echelons. Uh, uh, please use the mic sir, we'll be just pass it on. If I can talk about the cybersecurity skill set, that is uh, topmost uh, requirement for everyone, right? Uh, and if I can see the uh, kind of digitalizations, the kind of threat actors that are moving, the ki kind of requirements that everyone has, that includes the government organization, that includes the corporates, uh, and uh, the we can see the shortage of skills uh, into the overall industry. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, in each and every colleges where cybersecurity being, being they, they are getting into the subjects, but even there are specialized subjects. I can give you my personal experience with respect to getting the forensic uh, experts. And today, in case of any cyber breaches which are happening, uh, we don't get the forensic experts. Even as I spoke about that uh, human errors and uh, human is the first line of defense uh, and in an organization where ev and where the awareness part is also an important role but the security experts that includes the security operation center trade actors forensic experts uh, security analysts understanding the niche tools so there are niche skills which are available in the markets where the shortage of a lot of resources and uh, getting those resources from the colleges, from the universities, and then also within the organization, there, there is a skill development program that has been driven. But uh, if I can say over, overall, that skill set shortage and opportunities are very, very high with respect to the security domain and uh, forensic also. So here are my thoughts towards that. Uh, security domain should be the first priority for, uh, for for everyone and it's to be covered from wherever we can right so we are uh, not only every individual has knowledge of of each and every tactics the knowledge of importance of the work that we are doing and uh, the security that is being increased by everyone for everyone and everyone should know that what is happening right so that's the way uh, and the and the kind of digitalization that we have each and everything the kind of technology that we are moving so where security is going to play an important role and uh, the data safety data privacy data protections the requirements the data protection law which are coming in the privacy bits which are coming in so we need a lot of lawyers with respect to privacy 
So these are some of the things which I can we can put forward, and we need that kind of experts SMEs to be made available. So we are not only cyber safe Navy government; it's a cyber safe India. That's what my thought is. Thank you so much, sir. Ram Chidani, sir, you are coming, please. So to take your question on user industry academia interaction, uh, I would say that uh, there has been a lot of movement forward in this direction. So from the time when I began my career, you know, to reach a defense establishment looked like, uh, and to maybe even enter an admiral's room looked like it wouldn't be possible. But a uh, lot of that has evolved and, you know, there is a connectivity that has been created between the user and the industry and probably this drive towards uh, atmanirbharta etc has kind of opened up you know the user has started talking about his problems and this whole shroud of secrecy has opened up to some extent uh, about the academia somewhere i feel that uh, there is still some distance between the academia and the industry and the user and again though various efforts are being made i know that the army has set up its you know army technology board and they've created various platforms like idex etc where they're trying to involve academia but i think there is overall a lack of platform enough platforms where this kind of interaction can take place and probably there is uh, opportunity for uh, different groups to come and uh, help in bridging this or platforms for these kind of interactions because uh, unless this happens at a much greater scale you know like uh, Prapul was talking about uh, acoustics for example there is no uh, curriculum for acoustics in uh, various institutes and the need for this unless it is put back into the academic environment, there would be challenges. So yes, there is a need for uh, more effective platforms for this type of interaction. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Safika, sir, please. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about uh, industry user uh, interface and context with underwater domain awareness. Now. Uh, if you look at maritime domain awareness or within maritime domain sir, on the surface, uh, if there is any distress anywhere from the moment a beacon is activated to it being distress being picked up and relate to the particular area of coordination center and response action started, it nearly happens in real time. Uh, but when you do it for underwater, and wh why I'm saying so is we had about six, seven years back two cases of uh, we lost the aircraft, Air Force aircraft in Andaman Sea and uh, Coast Guard aircraft, the proximity to the coast. We could never detect the uh, signal from because uh, the signal which is transmitted on surface gets detected through satellite in, in real time. But the, if it transmission happens underwater, that signal will not be detected. There are different uh, beacons, low frequency beacons, but their ranges are so small and then we do not have proper. Uh, that that was, I think, area which, uh, in fact, at, at least discusses with uh, Arnav. Probably, where do we stand? If there are another instance of that can happen, we lose an aircraft in the open sea. Uh, there's just no uh, further we have gone. The way we have developed our uh, surface SAR system, uh, because uh, we periodically do the exercises for surface SAR system, where the without advance notice beacons are activated at different locations to see how much time is taken to locate the distress alert for, with exact location. Uh, so I thought this is the area probably with which industry and uh, users can take up. And definitely, we don't know when that requirement will occur. And if from my discussion, I see probably we are not gone further, much further since six, seven years, years back when we couldn't locate the wreckage or the uh, place of where the aircraft had gone down. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll request Vikram, sir, then we'll come to the chair to sum up. Um, so from my perspective, uh, uh, this is a big issue uh, in terms of the industry versus academia uh, gap or the connect. 
So connect is leading to the gap. And uh, in fact, on 9th of March, uh, there was a NESCOM uh, technology leadership forum at Mumbai. And I happened to be in a round table discussion. Um, they, the NESCOM has been given a mandate to train 2 million uh, population on digital literacy part. The AI, um, uh, blockchain, and cybersecurity are the three important areas which they are focusing on. So in fact, uh, at our college, uh, you can ask the students seated behind, they've been given a mandate that at every semester, you must have one certification in addition to the curriculum. There's a necessity. Until, uh, unfortunately, when we are uh, tight jacketed in terms of university curriculum, there are many times it happens that we are not able to deviate. That's the curriculum part. So that is one necessity. Uh, as an academic uh, setup, we put a question to industry that if there are gaps, please identify branch-wise, stream-wise, sector-wise. So uh, I am given to understand that NESCOM has, uh, has mapped it. So now we are requesting NESCOM that if that is the case, you share with us. And then we put it into our system. Uh, if there are private universities, of course, they can change their curriculum. If suppose yesterday AICT has uh, given a, a BTEC in semiconductor engineering, my international university can just straight away start from the next coming academic session. But it, it will take its own time to come into Pune University. So if that is the case, like you mentioned about uh, uh, underwater uh, uh, acoustics, for that matter, yeah, I agree. I mean, there is. There is no, I think in my opinion, there's no uh, uh, college or university offering that kind of a curriculum. So gaps have to be uh, mapped. And talking very generic, uh, that the communication skills are weak, that is what I observe from almost every industry person coming for the placement. Are we too to take measures? But it has to be quantified. And that is what an insistence uh, when we are interacting with the, with the industry, please tell us. The uh, couple of other things which, uh, I don't know whether they are radical for that matter, but then um, I put a, a point across that why not the way like we are putting the industry people in our board of studies? Why not in academia people can be part of the uh, boardroom uh, discussions? And the, your problem uh, areas which are generated at the the, at the industry level can they not become the the case study in our in the academy system? So. Uh, we have to probably, of course, uh, we have to handhold each other as uh, as two uh, entities. But uh, there is a need of our to uh, identify the gaps, uh, jot them down, and then make them crisp. Thank you. Thank you, Profilji. Your quick comments. You know, I'm a great guy at breaking down silos. I don't believe in hierarchies. I I respect everything, but yes, uh, you know, like things have to be done and got done. How do you get it done? If you need to short circuit the system, blow it up, subvert it, I'm all for it. And in the right way, you know, I'm not, I don't believe in this Jugaad thing of India where you try to beat the system. No Jugaad. How can we improve the system? How can we take it to a different level? That's what I believe in. And it's possible. Within the existing framework, using innovative ways, it's possible. I've done it. I'm a living example of it in so many domains, in, in, in law, in industry. I've done it everywhere. I don't know, that's how I'm hardwired, but I believe it can be done, and it should be done. Because, you know, as a nation, we have everything. God has blessed us. The location on the world map, uh, the resources we have. You know, there's this joke when, uh, they, uh, you must have heard it, I just repeat it. Now, God made this world and allocated the resources and all and told the people, you go and live in your respective countries or wherever, geographies. So all these guys were going back and people were criticizing God. The Arabs were saying, look at him, he's so unfair, he's given us oil which will be discovered thousands of years later. In the meantime, what do we do? We live in the desert. So everyone was criticizing God. And God, of course, could overhear everything. So when he, they all said the Indians have been really, God has been unfair. And they said God is an Indian. So God said, no, I'm not an Indian. I'm for everyone. And these guys went back and said, sir, you haven't done the proper allocation of resources. 
So he says, no, I have done a proper, believe me, I am God, I have done the right thing. They say, no, sir, and they tell him uh, the same thing all over again. But God says, yes, look at the people I have put there. Nah? I have given them all the resources, but look at the people I have put there. See, we are to be blamed. I don't agree when we blame our colonial masters, 2000 years of uh, whatever happened. But I mean, what were we doing all these years? Uh, when are we going to take responsibility for ourselves? Are we going to take responsibility for ourselves or not? I mean, that's one question we every Indian has to answer. I mean, there is a thing called the power of one. Have you seen that photograph of Tiananmen Square? Square that one boy was standing there in front of the tank. That went viral and you know, that is the power of one. You can take on the system. You know, the most powerful person in this country is not the Prime Minister, not any Babu sitting anywhere, no one. It is the citizen of India. The citizen of India has to realize what he or she can do and you can take on the whole system. The whole system has been created to serve you, mind you. That's what I believe. And that's why I'm so happy to see the olive green here, the white navy and the camouflage and so many students, people from uh, Maharashtra State Government Intelligence, the CME. I mean, this is how a gathering should be. They should, you know, uh, there was a uh, professor, Anamika Barua from IIT Guwahati. And she says the good thing that has happened in the Indian educational system is Today, you can't start an IIT without the humani humanities being there. You know, I am for one who always say the father of geostrategy, the father of geopolitics, the Halford McKinder, he was the first person to start this department of geography at Oxford University in the late 1800s. Before that, geography was never ever taught as a formal subject. And mind you, Today is considered the father of geopolitics, geostrategy, the, his heartland theory. And not just that, what he did was he also he is the founder director of the London School of Economics. So you can understand the connect between geography and economics. A person like him understood that. And I'm so happy to have Sir from the Defense Forces working as a cam campus director in MIT. So that's a good thing. These are the good things happening in India. I'm so happy about it that the silos are being broken. They need to be blasted. Thank you. Uh, give it to the chair to conclude, sir. Well, um, how much time do we have? No, no, why? No, why? Why I'm asking is, I had one question for everybody, which I wanted to ask. What are the lessons we are going to learn from the Russia-Ukraine war? Can one of you give one answer, please? What is the lesson that you will learn, or you will learn, or anybody? But I am saying, if there is time, then I will ask this question. Yeah. I am trying to make it topical rather than, you know, ideological or philosophical. I think this will be of more interest to people. So from the cybersecurity point of view, sir, the learning that we have that we should be ready with our DR backup BCP, business continuity management and DR management point of view. Because during these situations, there are many, many uh, employees who are working into that uh, country, right? We, they have to, we have to move them to some other locations. Also, we need to provide the basic infrastructure that includes the the infrastructure with respect to staying accommodation as well as uh, providing them the connectivity, providing them the basic uh, connections to the offices. So here, BCP DR plays an important role. That is number one. Number two, uh, are you ready to face such cyber war also? So we have seen the kind of uh, the attacks that that were happening during those situations that the, the companies being targeted for attacks, right? Where uh, every organization needs to tighten their belt and they need to put a strong monitoring uh, uh, systems and they need to monitoring the threats which are being there from different different current countries uh, which are being uh, targeted through cyber attacks. So, uh, yeah. Talking about defending, can we do something which will be more proactive? 
can we create an army of hackers which will probably use their skills to do something for the country during a war situation? But sir, there are hackathons being planned, there are cyber security skill sets being enhanced, there are more people being uh, trained uh, with respect to uh, managing the security threats and alerts. There are, are awareness actions that are being driven to manage their proactive situations. There are proactive advisory being released to manage the threats. Uh, there are systems being uh, regularly monitored, patched proactively to ensure that the system should not compromise also. And uh, the monitoring alerts that we have at each and every locations, that is being also being monitored, the daily reports, the dashboards, uh, to avoid any type of uh, unforcing situations where which we may come across. Yeah. And, and the training part is playing an important role. Yeah. Then, uh, Mr. Ramchandani. Yeah. So, uh, two, two well, things, two things I would like you to concentrate on. Of course, I mean, you give your own thing. One is the American drone which was hit day before yesterday. What do I have to say about it? Do we have that kind of technology? And second is the submersible which was used by the Russians to blow up the bridge, which was uh, connecting uh, two uh, earth surfaces, Crimea and uh, uh, I forget the which part. No, no, not not Russia. I forget the name of the bridge. But these two things. I mean, do we have this kind of capability? And then, of course whatever uh, lesson you have learned. So, uh, the use of non-conventional warfare and the use of uh, drones, etc. Uh, I think the capability exists that we are in a position to deploy it effectively, convert it into a product which can be used is something that uh, probably we have to be a little more aggressive on. We, uh, there is a lot of stuff being done. We need to experiment with it. We need to try it. And I think it will evolve and we will be in a position to deploy it. The Russians were uh, smart to make that an incident where, uh, you know, they didn't have to fire at the drone. They just knocked it out in a very unique way. And uh, I think hats on to them for, you know, saying that you can't mess around with me and still not make it a conflict situation. So uh, that's another point. Uh, in terms of submersibles also, as you saw, we have a roadmap for actually building these kind of submersibles. And if we can bring in the uh, tactical people and the operations people to guide our uh, engineering teams on how these could be more effectively used or give them insights into that. Maybe we can make products which are, you know, can be used effectively. So in terms of technology, it exists and uh, it needs to be deployed more effectively. In terms of one lesson, I would say that, uh, you know, being self-reliant is important if, if you are in a situation like this, you have only yourself to look for to help you out. Yeah, I think uh, the basic lesson is that there is something called industrial age warfare and we have to be ready for that. It means self-reliance also, but it also means so many other connected things one has to think about. I think Admiral Verma wants to say something. Major things that come out from this particular thing is the world is interconnected. And uh, for long we've, uh, you know, uh, thought that we should, I mean, somebody will do something and we will do something. We'll do services. If you don't have the fab, what will you do with your services? So it cannot be. And our, at least if the lessons that India has, has learned is we've got everything in this country. Now the how is going to manage to ensure that these each one of these um, uh, uh, talents or whatever niches which we have, how do we bring them into the national perspective to uh, think whether it is blue economy, this et cetera, one. As per the uh, one, the, the, um, the drone, uh, 
as uh, Ramchandani is ATR, we call him ATR. I can't call him Ramchandani. We, uh, uh, yeah, that, that I've used to last 20 years, we've been calling him ATR. So it's right. It was an unconventional <clears throat> fight. He dumped fuel, made it thing, uh, he made it non maneuverable because the moment you uh, think, and he went close to it and just kicked it, finished. So it fell down. So it's, it's an unconventional one because he knew that that particular drone is is a surveillance drone, and he just got it. So you have, if you have a mad pilot, you can do everything. And I can assure you, and I can assure you, at least pilots, and I know because a lot of my classmates are pilots. I mean, they are quite unconventional in what they do when they are faced with a situation. Uh, is, I was just telling you know it's it it was not a plan it was a reaction of the decision taken by the pilot because uh, or the two there were two aircraft so the decision that's why they're not showing the video yet because they said they we've got the video we'll show it we'll show it. it is not directed by anybody it is some, uh, you know uh, decision they come to I've discussed this uh, with my own Air Force colleagues you know, we're all fighter pilots and all that. Uh, they say we do come into situations, and uh, if you go by the book, you will not come back. So you have to do, you know, something uh, there, which based on your experience. Obviously, when he touched that, after all, he's there. That fellow is very slow, so he's like a stone, the chap. So it's like a fast aircraft hitting a stone, also. So that also is a risk. So these are things they calculate and uh, come out. So it was a, it was a. I won't say jugad. It was out of the box uh, thing to do uh, something there to bring that down and make an issue about it. That is the whole thing. I think the lesson is uh, war is reality. And even if you go through a long spell of peace, uh, which develops uh, some kind of complacency to uh, the extent that resource allocation gets constrained and we tend, uh, tend to take peace for granted. And from Ukraine case, we have to learn that the war not just is reality, we have to fight our own war. Uh, that's probably the least. So from my perspective, uh, I think uh, if I look at it uh, as a nation, it's a gain. Because we could, uh, as a as a nation, we became stronger. Um, mentioned about hackathon. Of course, uh, it's a very organized, uh, structural activity in academic uh, uh, sector. That we got hackathons uh, and so on and so forth uh, for the students in the engineering uh, curriculum. Um, rupee became uh, rupee is being now used differently. Eighteen nations are accepting uh, our currency for trade. That's I think uh, one 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 aspect. Uh, so, in my general perspective, I think this war has given it, uh, has given us as a nation a lot of mileage. Our uh, position in the globe has become more and more uh, stronger. In, in the lighter, I just want to add to what he said. War is a reality because there are war mongers. You know the the industry, military, in, industrial complex uh, that that exists in the world, whether it is Russia, whether it is things. So. If there's a long time of peace, there'll definitely be war because you have to generate, you have to use your weapons to be able to think. We've seen that over the time. So war will always come. Today we may be in a comfortable situation, but we may not because uh, any day somebody can, we are connected with SWIFT for all our transactions and your SWIFT, like what's happened to Russia, he can't think. So interconnectivity is very good, but uh, you have to build systems to survive in case thing and i think this is, this is a time we have to start thinking about how to make survivable systems as a fallback and one day it's going to happen because the day you become number five from number five to number three number two you're going to face this so i think there's a lesson for us that if china is and also see that's you will be sanctioned but there are possibilities sanctions can't bite so that is also a lesson 
uh, that we can learn from this and therefore what do we do about it actually a, 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 um, this is just being put on the thing i think for education for all strategists to change their you know uh, thinking i agree with sir on the sanctions part <clears throat> you know india has been through sanctions before we were sanctioned after pokhran we brazened it and today we are a far stronger nation so that's uh, what I agree. But my take on the uh, in uh, the Ukraine Russia war is that uh, the do dollar dominance has been challenged. I mean, the too big to fail banks of the U.S. are tottering there. The European banks, Credit Suisse again is in trouble. They've got a lifeline. So it's a uh, India has done the right thing by standing up for itself. That our national interest is supreme. We've taken a neutral stand and. Multipolarity is going to be born. Uh, there is the US, of course, is there. China is challenging it. Russia is trying to bounce back in a better way. I mean, they're there, but they want to get up in the hierarchy. India is there, and India's rise going forward. I mean, we are already celebrating a $40 billion economy in 2047, but we'll get there. We have the wherewithal to get there, but it's not going to be easy. Look at what is happening to China at $18 billion when America is 22, and we are talking about 40. So it's our journey trying to be and realizing India's potential is there are going to be a lot of challenges. That's what I uh, like. To okay. Say. No, I just wanted to bring it back to the seas. I mean, uh, how are the Russians beating the sanctions? Is basically the seas which are being used in a, in a very innovative way. And uh, I mean, Russian oil and gas is still being sold, but it's being sold because they have created what they call a dark fleet, which keeps on doing uh, all the all the uh, uh, transportation that is uh, that is required. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that seas are very important. I'm coming back to the topic of the today uh, of today that uh, we have to give more and more attention to the seas around and uh, unfortunately we are not doing that yeah exactly and that was the second point that ultimately it's being done it's possible if you have your own wherewithals you can't depend on others We are not able to make a container. <laughs> no. Yeah. We can, we can definitely. No, our priorities have to change. Our priorities have to change. And I think the biggest lesson that one can learn, I mean, there are two lessons. One is, of course, this industrial age warfare, where you have to have enough production of steel, you have to have enough production of aluminium and all the metals that are required for fighting a war. Are we really uh, in that position? to sustain ourselves for years together and second thing is if there are sanctions then uh, the landmass is not of much use because you are very traceable when it comes to landmass uh, but the seas probably offer an opportunity which which are absolutely unique and i even heard that now the russians are trying to open the arctic route so that from Kamchatka, uh, they, they divert their their flows. And the Chinese are also going to finance a project which is going to take them uh, uh, through the Arctic route. So again, it's another sea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they have icebreakers and all things like that. So uh, let's not be very complacent saying that, you know, uh, we are very happy and Ache uh, Din are here and all that. but. You have to really think of what the future uh, challenge is, and the challenge is in the seas. So, if you don't want to be at sea, you have to be at sea. <laughs> Thank you. As you said rightly, bringing back to this uh, thing, in all this, we, the importance of underwater has not been spoken now the if like you, now nobody everybody says we don't know who bust that not 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 stream uh, pipeline right people have done it know it and uh, 
Seema Hirsch has also brought out, etc. But what were we doing? Where was the underwater awareness? Why did we not know what's happening there? That's exactly what this whole thing was, that you may have any number of ships, you'll track them, this, that, etc. But what's happening underwater? We have stopped, we, we, well, we never started. We have, yes, some sonars, we're looking at other submarines, other ships, etc. But there are a whole lot of other activities, right from bio to thing, which you should be aware. I mean, I'm not saying something will happen, you're aware, which means you should be looking there, you should be, what you call, getting that, searching for it, that means sensing it, you must uh, 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 get the data, you have to analyze the data, and you should be able to share the data with the stakeholders. And uh, that, and therefore, you require skills for this. And MRC in this workshop is just trying to tell you that where are the skills, where are the, let's bring the capability. We're already talking about using this, capa getting skills, uh, uh, well, capabilities of Africa, what did you say, Africa, of, uh, you know, uh, interacting with IOC, uh, you know, Australia, India, then you will get the people. So the whole uh, file, we are, I'm very happy now that, like he said, that which, which was in the Navy, where we always have the ocean in front and the Himalayas at the back, and that, that the nation has started looking in the last, say, 10 years. That's why you have Saga, there's that, all those things, that's fine. But I still believe that we are not looking under water. And that is the, uh, your future. Which, which and underwater, I will just add one point. I mean, how important the ocean and underwater domain is. Just now we're discussing with Admiral Verma that three Buria submarines carrying 24 Poseidon each, which are MIRV missiles, can control the whole world if they are at three predestined positions and, of course, mobile. So it brings us back again to the same topic. Seas and oceans are extremely important and they should not be ignored, neglected. Much more attention has to be paid uh, to the seas that we have around and we are very lucky geographically. So we have to take full advantage of that. Thank you. Thanks, I, in fact, in fact, yeah, yeah, I think I, I should uh, thank everybody all the panelists also for coming up with wonderful ideas and of course Kamuda Das for giving us an opportunity to hold the mic and you know have captive audience like this thank you thank you so much sir we really appreciate i think uh, we all i mean uh, must take credit that uh, i mean as uh, everybody spoke there is 75% water not 70 70 is marine and 5% is fresh water including the ice cover and if this is the first underwater workshop that you're attending, then as Prafulji said, that we have ourselves to blame. The water is very important. And as Admiral Verma said, underwater is even more important. There's, I mean, underwater is hidden. It is not obvious. So effort is required to know what is underwater. So thank you all for being here and uh, a very eminent panel. Uh, Ram Chandani, sir, thank you so much for spending the day with us. Really appreciate you coming down and spending the day with us, sir. <laughs> Cannot thank you enough. And all other panelists, sir, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Chair, sir, uh, uh, thank you very much for conducting the uh, session and really bringing focus to the entire underwater domain. Thank you very much. We'll break for tea. And this was the last session. Uh, some of the participants wanted to discuss a few things. We'll do it after tea. Thank you very much. Otherwise, officially, this is the last session. The uh, workshop ends here. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much.
Sorry. Sorry. I had a question. I am in the cottage lift project. The distance is 500 meters away. Service also I will take a call. I understand. I I retired, came back here, after the flow, that is something different. I I not Send it. Just for I'll just go back to the moment. 